Welcome back to another edition of the Talking National League podcast, episode 21 it is tonight. As you are probably well aware, this isn't a usual podcast, we're not streaming it live, it is set as a premiere, I do believe. Um, we're actually doing another phone-in, in fact, we're not doing a preview show this week, we're doing a phone-in. So I've spoke to as many National League content creators, podcasters, um, YouTubers and even commentators as possible to talk about their club's start to the season so far. Obviously, as you are well aware, we haven't been able to cover every single National League club in this episode. So I do apologise for those clubs that don't feature. However, you will know that your club will feature very, very soon. We've also done one of these before and your club may have featured on previous um, phone-ins. So go check some of the old ones if your club doesn't feature. As followed, these are the clubs that are going to feature tonight. Notts County, Southend, Altrincham, Halifax, Solihull, Woking, Wrexham, Scumbop and Chesterfield. I've chosen these nine clubs because I feel these clubs, there's a lot to talk about on their start to the season, whereas as if I chose a different club that's, let's say, banging mid-table as everyone expected, there'd be very, very little to talk about at the moment. This recording has also happened over the past three days. Some of these games were before the previous game week was obviously Tuesday night's fixtures, one of those being uh, Wrexham versus Halifax. That game has been played However, both those recordings were uh, talked about previ previous to that. However, we don't really go into too much detail about that game um, at all. Um, so, yeah, they have gone on over the past three days or so. So, please, if you do hear us talking a bit about the upcoming games, just be well aware that them games may have happened already. Um, yeah, can I just ask, and it's not really a big ask at all, could you please drop the podcast a like? It is totally free. And also uh, drop us a... Uh, a sub if you haven't already that'd be much appreciated i don't think i'd be a very good youtuber if i didn't ask you to do that and i don't believe it's too much of a big ask to be honest so yeah if you can please drop us a like and a sub if possible that's probably about just enough of me waffling now as always and the first guest that we'll be speaking to tonight is Notts county's all-time record goal scorer leslie brad on how Notts have started this season I'm pleased to be joined by Leslie Brad, um, Notts County all-time record goal scorer, to talk a bit about Notts County's start to the season. Les, I think the first thing we have to talk about is how's how's it been so far down um, in Nottingham? Sorry, Luke, how's it been down uh, in Nottingham so far this season for the for Notts County? This season, yeah. Um. Well, obviously, we uh, we had changes at the start of the season with the new head coach coming in. Um, the previous head coach, Ian Birchnall, done a, a really good job. Um, he, he brought in a, a new style of football. Um, we were scoring lots of goals, uh, also conceding a few as well. Yeah. Um, he left us and went on to Forest Green, and um, we took a, a little while in, in, in getting a, a new head coach in, but... Um, Luke Williams came in after probably three or four weeks and um, I'm not sure that the supporters completely warmed to it to begin with, but he has proved um, to every supporter of the club just what a great asset he is to Notts County Football Club. Um, yeah, it's yeah, he certainly has done, hasn't, hasn't he so, so far, Luke Williams, for Notts County? Do you think at the time... I, I, do, I think, like you've mentioned, a lot of Notts fans were a bit split with their opinions on him because of what, I don't know you could say what Ian Birchnall had done because he hadn't got you promoted, which is obviously the aim for Notts County. But he was quite a high, highly rated manager and there were a few players that left the club last season, one big name being Carl Wooten. But you look at the replacements that you brought in and I was speaking at the start of the season about this, they were probably at least matched them and probably up to this date now, probably better than them, aren't they? And including the manager uh, being one of those as well. It couldn't really have gone any better, could it, for Notts County so far? Would you agree? Well, before Luke came in, we did sign um, a couple of players uh, from Gateshead. Yeah. Um, I'm sure everybody, all your, your listeners will will have heard of, of, of one of those. Uh, Macaulay mm -hmm. Langstaff, who's banged in. He, he's on a chase um, with uh, Harland at Manchester City. Yeah. He's kind of outgunned this season. Uh, and also... Um, Jedwin Scott, um, who also scored over 20 goals for, for Gateshead, and he's come in and I think he's scored six already. So well, what has been um, very encouraging is, is hearing the, the players um, 
talking about the manager. Uh, yeah. What we hear a lot about is, um, will this player stay at the club? Will that player stay at the club? I'm more concerned that the manager stays at the club. Yeah. He, he, he's come in and his pre-season um, was about doing two sessions a day, getting fit, um, because he has worked so hard um, when we lose the ball. Um, the players have had to be fit. And you'll find, if you watch Notts County now, once they lose the, the, the ball, the whole team are, are work, work very, very hard to get it back again. It puts the, the opposition under a lot of pressure. And I think that's been the main attribute of, of Luke. And he's also worked hard with the um, working on the strengths of the players he's got, not trying to have a, a system in place. Yeah. He knows the, the two lads that play up front, Langstaff and Scott, he knows they score all the goals um, in and around the six-yard box. They're not going to be goals of the season contenders, but um, he's not too concerned about that. And uh, the, the the teams that play, they look at getting balls in there for them to score. And, you know, we, we, we're not into November yet, and they've scored over 20 goals between them. Yeah, so, exactly. yeah, things are looking really good at the moment. Yeah, I do think the headlines do always go towards Langstaff and Sedwin Scott, but... You look at the other side of the team, and I'm sure you'll be able to digress a bit on this. You look at the likes of Matty Palmer and how good of a player he is uh, in that midfield uh, for Notts County. Taylor being another one, um, you know, scored that prolific goal. Well, it, uh, it was a quality goal, wasn't it, against uh, Maidenhead? And even defensively, like Notts County, I think something that people have always thought is this team that you could potentially exploit defensively. You know, Halifax knew that from the previous season, where this season they seem a lot stronger, don't they, defensively? And they just seem like an all-rounded, better side and more uh, developed side. Would you agree? I think that they're, they're, they're choosing um, the times better this season to get the ball forward. When uh, um, we, I think possibly we, we, we were a, more of a possession team last season where this season we're prepared to, to take a chance in, in playing balls forward that um, might create an opportunity. And um, each and every one of those players, including the goalkeeper, is able to come out and um, and play under those circumstances. Yeah, certainly. I, I, I totally agree with that. And, I, and like I've mentioned, that, that not side this season, it's so strong. The only like think disadvantage, and it could become a disadvantage, where Notts have probably thrived in previous seasons, is obviously the lack of depth in the squad. Is that something for you that concerns you potentially? when injuries start ticking in the winter months? Well, the owners of the club, of the club have... Uh, that, that They wish to, to run the club with 22 um, first-team players, uh, full-contracted players, and two players for each position. Um, that's where they come from. If they need any other players because of injuries, then they like to go down the, the loan system of, of, of bringing in players. They have a business that... Um, has data on um, on players uh, from abroad, from the Premiership yeah. through to non-league, with all the stats. Not just players; this is managers as well. So they're able to um, to see who's available. Um, they're, they're not looking to bring in five hundred thousand pound players. Let's put it that way. Yeah. They're yeah. more uh, happy to bring in a, a player who might be not quite working out but the stats show that he can do um, this and he, or he can do that uh, and, and, and give um, the head coach an opportunity to work with them. So, um, yeah, you, you mentioned a few names there. Matty Palmer's one. Um, we, we have a very strong uh, midfield, um, as I see it, players who are very much into um, showing for the ball, um, happy to play one-twos, in around the um, either side of the halfway line to get um, through lines to to open up defences, um, and virtually all the games that, um, well, certainly all the games that I've watched this season, yeah, and they've been a joy to watch, and, yeah. and um, the players have done really well. Yeah, you mentioned data there and bringing in players from abroad. I think a prime example of that would obviously be Ruben Rodriguez. How key is he for Notts County? Not just this season, but in previous campaigns as well. 
Yeah, we brought in Cal Roberts from uh, Blythe Spartans um, and he showed tremendous ability. He's gone to the Premiership in Scotland now with, with yeah. Aberdeen. Um, every week we pick up the paper and there's um, supposedly interest from Championship clubs for Ruben Rodriguez. Yeah. A player with magnificent ability. Um, um, the goal he scored on Saturday was just, on, uh, sorry, on Friday evening was fantastic. You know, outside the box, stuck it in the top corner. Um, yeah, so the, 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 it certainly works, the, um, the, the data system, when um, you analyse, um, you see, to give you an example of, of how it works, um, I, I walk around the hospitality room on match days and talk to the guests and um, yeah. going back, over a year ago, there was a table with 10 chaps on this table and I went up to the massive Thuan Ox fans and they said, no, they work for the boss of the club. I was said, oh, you work for the data business. She said, yeah, he's rewarded us um, for our work that we did on Cal Roberts. Um, we've all been involved in providing information that has got him to the club. So it's not like the, the old days of scouting systems where you sent a scout who watched the player who, who filled in a report and sent it back. Yeah. But now the, the, the scrutiny is all aspects of, of a player, not just his heading ability, his passing ability, his tackling ability. It, it goes on forever, really. And, and, and from that, there is less likelihood that um, the signing will fail if, if, yeah. when you have all that much data to work on. So, yeah, um, I can't. Sorry. Oh, no, no worries. Um, I can't remember actually, and not signing in previous seasons where knots have actually come down. And like you mentioned, actually being a bad signing that's out of his depth. I know at the moment there's a bit of speculation in the, in the knots camp a bit about Cairo Mitchell's ability. Um, however, you know, he's not in the, I won't say not in the first team, but he's not really getting in the starting 11 over the likes of Langstaff and Kedwin Scott. But I look at Notts this season and I look at games like Maidstone at home, Maidenhead at home. Maybe in previous seasons you would have dropped points there potentially because Maidenhead or Maidstone have put 11 men behind the ball. Where this season it feels like Notts, you know, they're finding ways to win against the weaker sides and against the stronger side as well. You know, you look at Wrexham and how crucial that game was at home. I think Wrexham were probably the favourites going into that just based off the money that they've spent compared to Notts. But Notts managed to get the win there. Chesterfield at home, coming back from 2-0 down, that's a massive statement. Even Solihull at home as well, managing to win that game. It just shows how strong Notts County are this season, that they're picking up points against the top sides, but also not dropping points to the, to the so-called weaker sides in this division. Are you spot on with what you say, Luke? They've um, they found, found ways. And um, prior to the Colville game, which they couldn't find a way to win, <laughs> They had three really tough games, like you say, um, against Altringham, um, Wrexham, um, and uh, who was the other game? Uh, Woking. Woking. You know, Woking stats are showing that they were the fourth best team in the league at Pressy, you know. And and each of those three games, they could have lost, but they found ways, they worked together, and they found ways how to win those games. And it was, it, it was tough, and that has been quite a key element i think to Notts county this season um that the um the backroom team the head coach are working and working and analyzing the opposition and and seeing how they can there's sometimes you the, the star player from the previous week might be yeah. rescued for the for the next game because they found they think selecting another player might um might be the the answer you, you just mentioned caro mitchell you know caro mitchell came on at Boreham Wood and he looked like he'd won the game for us with a fantastic yeah. goal. So, yeah, I, I take your point. Um, but as I say, the, 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 they're working really hard for each other and the players are working really hard. They, they've um, they've all kicked into the manager's requests and, and we're seeing the fruits of all of that. That's it, It's come together really well. The Wrexham game was um, probably one of the toughest games I think at, um, I've seen them play. I thought the first half hour, we completely dominated the game. Jim O'Brien was having a fantastic game. He got injured, he went off, and Wrexham managed to find ways of, of causing more problems to us. And the, the second half, each and every player for Notts County had to dig in and, and fight to uh, to stay in the game. And we came out with a 1-0 win. So, 
yeah, um, lots of different ways to winning football matches, not just about playing football and yeah. going out there scoring goals. I think there was always that thought, wasn't there, when Nuts lost that first game, how they bounced back? Because we've put, seen in previous seasons, you know, not start the season well or they get a bit of momentum and start being very consistent. But then as soon as that defeat does come, they go on a, a bad run of form where this season, talking away, losing that. Obviously, there's a lot of people who have different opinions about the pitch down at Dorking, etc. And sides like Notts County, it doesn't particularly suit their sort of playing style, does it? Um, but obviously getting defeated there, I think it was great to see that Notts bounce back straight after that game and not, not being defeated like they have been in the past and dropping points. Was that promising from you to see that they didn't go down the route of losing one, two, even three games in a row? Yeah, I went down to the Dorking game and um, there wasn't too much wrong uh, with what they did. They had 20, I think it was 23 chances to score. Um, yeah. It was one of those days that it just didn't happen to them. Um, there were some very poor goals conceded. I think all the players will agree to that. Um, but they got together and rolled their sleeves up and came out fighting and went up to um, York the following week and got a fantastic win at yeah. York, who I think had gone five games undefeated. So, yeah, um, these little challenges come to test every team. Um, if you, Especially when you're playing at the top, every team that wants to beat you, don't they? So um, they certainly fought the way back and, um, you know, they've gone on and won the last five league games. Yep. Obviously, it's very, very early on in the season. But from now, do you think Notts County have what it takes to win the league? Because, of course, that's something that Notts want, isn't it? They don't really want to be going in the playoffs because we've seen previously it's probably not for them, is it, Notts? It's not their way of getting promoted. They, 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 I've always thought when Notts go in the playoffs, they're just not, I don't think, consistent enough in the playoffs to get promoted. So I think for you, it's got to be the league title, hasn't it? Or at least second or third, which I'm sure Notts will get. But for you... Do you think Notts do have what it takes to win the league title? And do you think that's what is needed this season? I think we're just over a third of the way through the season and uh, not seen all the teams yet. We've played just over a third of the, the matches. Um, we've played Chesterfield at home. We've played Solihull at home. We've played Wrexham at home. So we've got to go away to those places and yeah. see how we can perform there. But um the evidence is on what I've seen so far this season, we're, we're doing an absolutely fantastic job. Um, as, as time rolls on, we, we, we'll get to find out whether the squad's big enough with injuries. You know, we saw last year how Chesterfield were going so strongly and then the key man gets um, a broken leg and, yeah. and their, their results went off after that. Um, I'm touching wood here and hope that doesn't happen to us, but um you never know in football, but, um, you know, currently you could not ask for any more. I'm pleased to be joined by Toby to talk about Scunthorpe United. Uh, I've joined, we've joined a few times haven't we, this season, Toby, and I doubt one time, I don't think one time it's ever been positive, has it? And um, unfortunately, no. <laughs> this time, probably even more negative, potentially. Um, yeah, talk us through Scunthorpe's season then. Yeah, well, I mean, we all expected it to be a difficult season, but I think... <sighs> Right now, it, it just goes from bad to worse, really. We had that sort of minor improvement on the doors over sort of the last month. But since then, you know, we've gone back to square one. I think the honeymoon period sort of ended um, back to where we were. Um, it's been abject recently. Um, there's no positive signs from the club at all regarding the takeover. Um, the players seem quite disinterested. Um, I mean, we've gone 26 games without a clean sheet now in a row, which speaks volumes about where we are as a club. Um, every game we go into it expecting to get beat now, I think. Um, and to be honest with you, I don't, I don't know where we go from here. You know, we, we keep on, you know, on this podcast, we just say the same thing about Scunthorpe. It's always, you know, depressing. It's always bleak. And, you know, it's been the case now for the past four or five years. And that doesn't seem to be any sort of light in the tour now. It just seems to continue. And we just go from bad to worse all the time. So I think I'm obviously positive to say about it because we're just we're just terrible. And that's the honest truth about it. What is your biggest weakness this season on the field? Oh, on the field, where do you start? I mean, goalkeeping wise, I think most Scunthorpe fans will say that Dewhurst hasn't really had a great start to the season. Um, for me, the midfield's a big problem. You know, on paper, again, we have players like Butterfield, Whitehouse, Beeson, but 
all the players can just go straight through our midfield every time. You know, one incisive pass and you're through because they have no pace. Um, you know, you can just run past our midfielders and they won't put a tackle in. You know, against older shot, um, I think it was for their their second goal. Tyler Corner, a centre back, who was a scum club, he was awful for us. He literally runs through the def- midfield, sorry, and just scores. Yeah. Like this happens every game now. We are torn apart like a hot knife through butter in midfield every time. Um, Joe Nuttall has been one of the few sort of standout players for us. He's been decent along with Rob Apter, mm-hmm. but we haven't scored in the past two games till now. So that's a bit of a concern. We had one shot on target all game on Saturday. So, I mean, looking at it from that point of view, the whole team is, you know, just nowhere near where it should be. So I think it'd be harsh, like, say there's one particular player that's been the worst, um, really, but... Overall, the performances from the whole team in the past two games, especially, have been nowhere near good enough. Absolutely nowhere near. You know, I left on Saturday just feeling really down about it all. It sort of hits home like how bad we really are. Um, so yeah, I I don't know. It's just it seems that the whole team just isn't particularly bothered right now, um, and the whole club just sort of, I guess, echoes that whole ownership thing. You know, the manager we can't afford to get a full time manager in. You know, having an yeah. academy coach playing sorry taking over. So, looking at it from that point of view, the, the club just seems destined to fail, really. There's there's nothing that's screaming, oh, yeah, you know, safety. I don't I don't know. It's, yeah. it's just, it's bleak, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that is the crucial thing about Scunthorpe, isn't it? Safety this season. Stability, in fact, because mm, Scunthorpe yeah, haven't, yeah. been stab- haven't been a stable club for a number of years now, even when they survived in the Football League. It's always been that feeling that one season we will get relegated into non-league and last season obviously was the season but recently that form did start to pick up um, a lot of draws and I think it was always the feeling that we're starting to get on track now we're starting to get a few vital points but we need to be turning those draws into wins you've got to even look at the likes of Dorking at home the mm. character from the team um, it's come from I think 2-0 down against Dorking Wanderers a side that's so hard working um, and win 3-2 away, uh, 3-2 I think it speaks volumes about the side but the thing is, you go after that, Torquay, Oldham away, Aldershot, you don't feel like anything's changed. And I think, did you feel after that game that potentially was a turning point for Scumthorpe? I was hoping it would be a catalyst for change, yeah, but it wasn't. You know, we, we didn't build upon that. You know, Torquay game, it was two poor teams. We got a draw. You know, we, we, not all had a big chance to win, but he he put it wide, unfortunately, in that game. Oldham, again, we had a really good first half. Second half, they came on to us and we folded. Um, older shot game was embarrassing. Half time winning three one, we bottled it completely, and then South End again, we were just completely, you know, dominated the whole game. So, I mean, after Dorking, we all sort of felt, you know, a lot better. We thought, you know, we've had a few draws here, we've won finally. Can this? Can we improve now? But we didn't. You know, we we just completely bottled it again, really. Um, so we all hoped that we might do okay. But the thing is, we had this sort of same thing last year because when Keith Hill first came in in November, similar time to now, obviously. He came in, I think we had five draws and one win. The exact same as Tony Dawes. And now obviously we've lost two after that. So is it going to be the exact same as this time last year? Probably. I mean, yeah. I, I don't see it changing. So like we have these sort of false dawns. We have a brief period of sort of respite, you could call it. And then after that, we fold again and it's back to square one. So it, it, it just seems a carbon copy of this time last year under Keith Hill when he initially came. And obviously... You know, Keith will end it up. So, hopefully it's not as bad as that, but I wouldn't bet against it at this point. Yeah, certainly. I think what's quite interesting when I look at statistics and, and what they show, um, Oldham and Scunthorpe both have the worst away record in the division um, and they both haven't actually won a game away from home. That's quite concerning, I would say, as well, uh, from Scunthorpe's perspective, to say that at home, You've only had the two wins so far this season. But just quite an interesting um, thing when I look at the upcoming games, like you've mentioned uh, off air, there's obviously a lot of tough games coming up after uh, Gateshead, which is obviously a tough game. It's a significant game. And, of course, Barnet away as well. But after that, you've got a strong Eastleigh side, Wrexham at home, Maidstone, Dagenham. Do you think you could potentially do better against the better sides in the division like Wrexham who will come to scum pop and potentially underestimate you, which we probably have seen before. Potentially, because Wrexham's away form isn't isn't incredible. And our home form, it's not great, but it's not exactly a failure at this point. So we have to approach those games, you know, 
We'll we'll defend all game. We'll play five at the back. We'll try and sort of play on the counter attack with the pace yeah. of Aptor and Nuttall to try and break them. But we just have to get some points, no matter who it's again to this point. We just need to get some points on the ball because we could be cut adrift easily now. You know, if we get beat tomorrow to Gateshead, you know, we'll be around three points off safety. And that gap can get worse and worse, you know, very, very quickly and easily, especially with four teams going down this season, you know, compared to two in League Two last year for us. So it's, I mean, yeah, Wrexham game, it, it, it could be a big upset. You know, we, we could pull off a point for us would be massive against Wrexham, obviously. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I don't really feel very confident about it. You know, looking at their attack, you know, Paul Mullin, um, Oli Palmer, you know, they've got they've got League One caliber strikers playing in the National League. And against our defence and now a goalkeeper, you know, you won't bet against them scoring three or four, to be honest with you. So again, football is very, very unpredictable. But if I was to say to you right now, I think that game would be, you know, a two, three, four nil to Wrexham. And and that and that's being like conservative there, really. So I know it's quite uh, I know it's quite a hard question to answer this because they have a little positives. But if there's one strength of, of Scunthorpe going forward that you've potentially seen a bit of a bright spark uh, within the group that could potentially cause other sides problems, what would Scunthorpe's um, strength be? Well, it's definitely attack Rob Apter and Joe Nussel. I mean, Apter, how he's played in this league, I have absolutely yeah. no idea. He should be in the EFL, you know, without doubt. He's been incredible. Um, like, he's very direct. You know, he drives up plays. He's fast. We've not had a fast winger at Scunthorpe for ages since Aloisa. You know, back yeah. in the sort of the league two days. Um, so he's been the sort of one bright spark. Obviously, not all has scored seven goals in 14. That's a great return for him so far. But just recently, he's not been that great. You know, he's been a bit yeah. inconsistent. He misses a lot of chances. But again, to score seven goals in this struggling team is no mean feat in itself. Um, so, yeah, defensively, you, you know, we've conceded 29 goals in 14 games, which again is disastrous, really. But yeah. going forward... You know, we are scoring goals. Granted, the last two games we've not, but before that, we were scoring. Um, but it's just a defence, you know. We, 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 we ship far too many goals. I mean, yeah. for us to win games, we have to score at least three, go three goals, really, because we concede, you know, two or three every game now, it seems. So yeah. we have this sort of, like, tactic of trying to outscore the opposition. But when, when you concede, you know, in the first 10 minutes, almost every game, you're setting yourself an almost impossible task, you know. So... If we didn't start games so slowly and so poorly in the first place, we might have a decent chance of getting a few wins here and there. But every game we just start it disastrously. I think um, in the last, I think six games we've considered in the, t in the first ten minutes in four of those occasions. So I mean, like you're always yeah. going to be a downfall in it from the start there. So mm -hmm. you haven't had one clean sheet this season, um, Scunthorpe United. Yeah, um, I think going yeah. forward for me, the one thing about Scunthorpe that I think. And I, and I still don't feel that Scunthorpe will go down. I think they've got the quality there to turn it around, potentially. And I think a lot of this is down to the ownership and things going off, off the field, why they are performing so bad off the field. But one positive for me is the fact that they have got that strength going forward in Natal, who is a goal scorer, has proven it. And yes, isn't in the best of form at the moment, but going forward, if he can get back to you know goal scoring ways, which hopefully he will, and other players like Apta behind him, I can't see why Scunthorpe can't get out of this uh, sticky situation which they are in at the moment and hopefully improve and climb up the table as soon as possible. For you then, yeah. uh, Toby, finally, do you think Scunthorpe have what it takes this season to survive or potentially even go for higher mid-table? <laughs> are you gonna are you gonna be brutal and think it's it, you are it, you don't have the quality and because of things going up off the field, it's gonna be a, another doom and gloomy season for Scunthorpe United. I'd love to be optimistic and say to you, oh yeah, we'll turn it around. But the thing is, Aptor's loan expires in January, when, so when he'll return to Blackpool. Um, and we, we can't really replace him. He's been just incredible for us this year. He's been the one player that every game is, you know, really, really good, really fun to watch, mm -hmm. you know. Um, he'll probably go, yeah, not all will most likely leave as well. So, and we're not going to replace his guy. We, we can't afford to replace him, basically. So, once there you go, if we've not won at least four games between now and January, you know, where we're doomed, really. I mean, I, don't, I, I just don't know where to go from here because, you know, losing our best players happens every year because last year we saw Loft in January, you know, we, we won one game from January until May. And, you know, do, selling our best players in January 
you know, not replaced them properly. You, you're not going to expect to win games, are you really? Let's be honest. So it's 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 the typical sort of scum football play. We get like some decent players. They go in January. We implode in the sort of winter and springtime. We go down. And yeah. I, I love to prove them wrong, but the way I see it is that the best players will go. We're not going to win many games from now until another season, and we'll just go down again. So I mean, I what, again, yeah. yeah. I think what you've got to think is: are, are the three t- sides in the division that have worsted you this season so far? Sides that you've played so far, obviously, you haven't played all the sides. You know, we're about a third into the season now. Yeah. Has there been three sides so far that have been worse than you? And that's, I think, the question that has to be asked. And I look at Scunthorpe and. I don't really think there has been. There has been no, games where he's no. been slight unfortunate, potentially, but there has been games, potentially maybe Dorking at home. You may have more information as you were probably there. We're Dorking yeah, actually a weaker side. The thing is with Dorking game, it was a game of two halves, really, because the first half, they dominated us. They were actually really good. Time. But I think the second half, they just sort of tired quite easily. And we sort of managed to break them down by attacking almost relentlessly in the second half. Um, Yeovil were very, very poor because we beat them 2-1. Um, so you know, I know they're in dire straits themselves aren't they, this season, so they could be one that could be worse than potentially. Dorkin, yeah, but I mean, they're, they're, they're very hit and miss, though, because there's some games they can just put five past you. Other games they can just fold again. Um, yeah. Apart from that, there's been no other team that we've sort of been better, I don't think. But maybe um, Torquay in the second half, who were the better side, but again, we, we weren't incredible. Um, Oldham, they didn't really impress me an awful lot. But again, we couldn't beat them still. Um, so three worst teams on us at this point, no. Um, so maybe yeah, after I mean, maybe after tomorrow, you've got Gates and haven't tomorrow and yeah, Gates, another yeah. side down there. Obviously, this yeah. will be coming out for the viewers watching after that game. Mm-hmm. But as we are recording this on the Monday, potentially your opinion may have changed by tomorrow uh, come yeah, half a that's, yeah. that's a huge game for us there. Yeah, yeah. I think if, if we lose that one then alarm bells will really be raised. If we somehow win that one, you know, we'd I think we'd go to like 21st place, so we'd be definitely in contention there for safety. But yeah. tomorrow night, yeah, especially with it being a home game as well, it's it's already in October, it's a must-win game, which is a mad prospect to sort of like think of. But, you know, on our current form, we say so we've won two all season. You know, we, we've not, you know, we've won something like five games in 70, you know, over the past few seasons. And... That if that rate continues going forward, you know, we're going to be in the Midlands Counties League in a few years' time. So, you yeah. know, we, we can't we can't expect to survive on those sort of you know stats there, really. So, yeah, I mean, tomorrow night, big game, but lose that, and you know, that the, the fan base will be in uproar, and rightfully so, because it is just so bleak, really. So, I'm joined by Mark Francis from the working commentary team. Um, Mark, we'll be talking a lot about working. I think the first thing that I'll have to ask you give us an overview of it, working starts the season so far because it's been quite an impressive start, hasn't it? Yeah, it's been very positive, Luke. Uh, good start for working and indeed Darren Searle, who obviously joined as manager towards the back end of last season. Darren had eight games to assess his squad. Um, it was very much a luxury, of course, for Darren to come in with the side safe that he could play around with players that. Uh, were at, at his disposal and went into the summer knowing exactly what he needed. Woken have played 14 games so far this season, uh, seven victories, uh, five defeats and just the two draws. Um, it's yeah. quite similar to a couple of other teams of the league, most notably Woken's opponents tonight in, in Dorking, that they either win or they either lose. You know, they don't seem to draw many games, which has been a, a running theme for the last few years. As I say, it's been very, very positive. Uh, starting at home, Woken have only lost two games at home so far this season and as it turns out looking at the table they are the top two teams in the division in Notts County and Wrexham both winning 3-2 at the Lathwaite's Community Stadium. Wrexham actually winning 3-2 when Woking had uh, 10 men after just 10 minutes on another day that might have been a different result but uh, Woking have been very strong at home Um, they've scored two or more goals in every every home game so far this season so they know where the back of the net is uh, which we'll come to and their form certainly starting to improve on the road as well they've already had to uh, up the mileage in the last few weeks with some long away trips, most notably, of course, uh, to your guys, uh, to your team at Halifax, where they rode out a very comfortable 4 0 win. And uh, at the weekend, just gone uh, up at Gateshead, 3 1 winners there, probably the only blemish being that they didn't keep a clean sheet. So it's been a, a very positive start. They certainly know where the back of the net is. Uh, Reese Brown, uh, a new addition to Darren Sarr's team. Uh, Darren knows that there's plenty of money available. Uh, with with the board and the owners that have come in over the last 18 months or so. And Reese Brown, seven goals at Wilson so far this season, joined for big money uh, and plays alongside 
Uh, the likes of Padre Gamond, who only found the back of the net for the first occasion in the FA Cup, so he's yet to score in the league. And Padre Gamond, last time he played in the National League for Grimsby six years ago, he scored 30 league goals. So time is certainly of the essence for Padre Gamond, but uh, he's been helped by the fact that his striking partner, Reese Gregor Cox, has scored seven this term uh, as well. Five goals in his last four. And James Daly as well certainly deserves a, a notable a notable note, rather. Uh, six goals for him. Uh, joined, I think, from Stevenage off the top of my head. Uh, three goals in his last five, and he really works hard. So that's been the theme of, of Darren Sahl in the first 14 games of this season. He's always been speaking to me about establishing an identity uh, about the team. A woke, woke and work really, really hard. Uh, they press from the front, and they play really good football. And that certainly reflects in their league position. Currently seventh place, 14 games and seven wins, 23 points on the board, and a victory tonight should so, ho hopefully rather uh, consolidate their place in the league's top seven for the next couple of weeks. Yeah, that certainly is the aim to get in those top um, seven spots and in the playoff spots, in fact. Um, you mentioned the financial side of working. This season, it did feel like the players that you're bringing in were quite high calibre, quite a large squad with the players that you brought in. It did feel like this is the season where you need to be, you know, securing a spot in those playoff spots or at least be flirting with the playoff spots, in fact, because we've seen previously working historically have always been a non league side, but you've already always seen the aim there. They've always yeah. wanted to go into the Football League. They're probably a big enough club to be in the Football League with the attendances they're getting now, etc. And, of course, the quality that they've got in the squad now. So is, how crucial is it that working do get in the, these top seven spots this season? It certainly is, Luke, when, when, as I say, you put the money in that the board and the owners are. You know, John Katz has, has invested a lot of money into this team and he, and he wants improvement. And he's getting it. I mean, you probably spoke to so many people on this podcast about how hard it is to get out of the National League. It is very difficult all the time that it's going to be two places going up. And again, you look at the league table, Notts County and Wrexham are the top two and Chesterfield a third. Yeah. And it just goes to show how difficult it is to get out of this league. Now, Woken have never been into the Football League, as you say, rightly that they've always been known as a, a non-league club and most notably always towards the, the summit of the of the, of the non-league tiers, if you're right. Of, of course, in the last four years, they've been in the National League and once or twice have flirted with the idea of, of finishing in the top seven. This really feels like their year to do so. They've got a great team. They've got a great manager. Of course, Woken have got a great fan base down here in Surrey. And being in the top seven, it just goes to show where the club can go. And that's obviously where the ambitions lie, particularly with the fans. They know that they want more out of this team and they are getting it. And particularly when you look at the table now with the top seven as it is, you know, Notts County, Wrexham and Chesterfield, you know, they are three, three top, top teams who, you know, Two of those won't be playing in League Two next year. Let's let's say that for a moment. It's just incredible, uh, the standard and the quality of this league. Then you have the likes of Solihull who've thrown money at it as well. We're very unlucky uh, last year with the defeat to Grimsby in the final. Boreham Wood, Bromley, and then Woking. And Woking have got a great chance this year, particularly with other clubs struggling. Yeah. I mentioned off air with the, with the two teams that came down in in Oldham and Scunthorpe, Halifax, who were there last year. Not to keep bringing it up, obviously, but to see Halifax where they are is is such a shock. Torquay United, who would have had them bottom of the pile? You know, there's so many big teams underperforming. It sort of gives the emphasis to Woken and Darren Sol to say, look, this could be a very good opportunity, and indeed it is. You know, let, let's look at the fixtures that they have played. Yes, they played Notts County at home, Wrexham at home, and Sullyhole Moors at home. They have got to go to those places away. Let's yeah. not forget it. It's a long old season. But Woken, they always seem to start the, the campaign rather well. Um, I think crunch time will be over Christmas and in particular the games against Aldershot. You know, we spoke about it on the podcast last year, Luke, didn't we? About the games against Aldershot. Woken on paper really should be winning those. You know, Woken really, uh, Aldershot rather, really, really struggling towards the foot of the table. Have picked up in the last few weeks after, of course, sacking their manager. But Woken, they're such a terrible record against Aldershot, particularly at home as well. Or I think they've only won twice on their home turf in the 21st century. You know, those games are going to be coming uh, on Boxing Day and New Year's Day as well, which I'm really looking yeah. forward to, to commentating on. But from the Woken side, Woken really need to be winning those games this year. But we'll see. It's a long old season. We're, what, a third away through the campaign uh, and things are looking up. Things are looking good. Yeah. That is the concern, though, isn't it? That potential when the winter months start to come and injuries start to kicking. That's usually when Woken do fall away. We've seen it in the past. Um, I think about three seasons ago, Woken were top of the league for a bit of time yeah. in the top three probably until Christmas time then they suddenly just had that such terrible form in that second half of the season I don't know if it was down to injuries etc or whatever but just fell away and I think it was a bit of a blow and I think you sort of bottled it because you're in a very very strong position and I think that's the concern potentially this season however it does feel like you've got a lot more strength in depth 
I also highly rate your manager, Daryl Sarl. I think he has a lot to prove at working. I think he's highly rated there as well. You also look at games, for example, Halifax away from home. No matter what you say about Halifax and how poor we've been this season, score four games away from yeah. home at Halifax, which is historically in the National League always been a tough place to go, Halifax yeah. away from home. To score four goals away from home there, to beat Solly Moores at home, it, it, it's very, very promising. And you look at the Knots and Wrexham games, when realistically, I don't think many sides are expected to get anything out of those games. You could say you were slightly unfortunate not to get anything out of these games. So it does look very promising, doesn't it, at the moment, down in working. Yeah, absolutely. It certainly is. You know, I mentioned we played those big teams at home. The Wrexham game woke him very unlucky with the early red card of Kyron Lofthouse, who's been absolutely magnificent for Woking this season. You know, many fans from other clubs probably have recognised the name Kyron Lofthouse as a right back. He's now playing right wing and he's yeah. getting much further forward. He's a very, very pacey player and he probably should be playing there. So Woking signed Dan Moss in the summer to sit at right back. So they essentially play with two right backs now, uh, which is why they're much more defensively astute. Now, you mentioned there, you know, towards the, the last couple of years, Woking bottling it. I guess the explanation or the excuse, if you like, would be injuries, which creeps into every single team. Yeah. Um, but the one difference you'd, you'd look at the squad and indeed the manager this term is that they have a lot better strength and depth. You know, Woken have just shipped up two players on loan because they can't get back into the team. Sid Nelson, who joined from Millwall, can't get in the team. Tyreek Johnson, who's been a great player for Woken over the last 18 months, can't get in the team. And that's due to the success of the players that have come in. James Daly, for example. No one's going to take him out of the side at the minute. And, you yeah. know, when you can bring in players like Reese Brown, and you've got Reese Gregor Cox, Padre Gamond, and James Daly as your front line. Woking can score a lot of goals. And as I mentioned, the squad depth is very, very good. They play four at the back. Luke Wilkinson and Scott Cuthbert, bags of experience. I think I used a statistic a few weeks ago with the back five of Woking, Craig Roche, Josh Casey, Scott Cuthbert, Luke Wilkinson, and Dan Moss. They've all been a captain somewhere in their career. And obviously, Josh Casey, captain of Woking now. So there's, there's vast experience at the back at Woking, which they don't really tend to, to move anyone in the defensive line, the changes certainly come in midfield or or in the front line. And yeah. Rowan Ince was, I think, one of the signings of the summer, although he was already a Woking player to keep him, I thought was great a great bit of business. Rowan Ince was a star last term. You know, he took Brighton to the Premier League not so long yeah. ago. And he's been he's been fantastic for Woking. Rowan Ince normally sits alongside uh, Jermaine Anderson. Again, Jack Rolls can't get in the team. He's not started a game for Woking this term. And he, and he ended the last campaign really, really well indeed. Again, got a new contract, but just can't find his way into the team. So the Woken have, you know, they're doubling up in every single position. If, if if a player goes out injured or a player suspended, they've got someone to come in. And again, this is something that you'll probably talk about come January, February, March. What are the squad depths? That's why, you know, lots of, you know, lesser teams, if you like, start so well. You know, Barnet, what a great few weeks they had. Wilston, what a great few weeks they had. When the big teams start hitting top gear, the table then will very yeah. quickly move. And especially when it gets to January and February, when those teams have obviously backed up some of their reinforcements, bringing in more players, the, the big guns certainly get to the fore. Yeah. But, you know, Woken, dare I say it, have no right to be there. They put a lot of money into the team. Uh, they're not the biggest side in the league, as we know. We've always been a, a non-league club. But when you're only, what, 10 points behind Knox County and Wrexham and Chesterfield and Solihull have put a load of money into the team, why can't they do that? Why why can't they be amongst those? And, you know, it's, it's the most exciting start to a campaign I think many Woking fans have felt for, let's say, the best part of 10 years. Of course, a couple of relegations in that time. Uh, but now being in the top tier of non-league football, they've got a great chance to get into the playoffs. And let's face it, if Woking finish the, the season in seventh, will I back them to, to get promoted? Probably not. But why not? They've got a great chance. We always see... There's always the that thought, isn't there? You, you look at Grimsby, don't you? Um, exactly. You looked at them and they're always you always think like a Bromley or a Solly on a working side like that would potentially get promoted from the National yeah. League in those plus because they're a bit of a, a banana skin for size like your Knotts and your Chesterfields and even your Wrexham's in the playoffs. But I think another strength of, is the fact that you can just buy a playoff at another side like a Wheelstone, another playoff contender probably still in that mix. But to take probably one of their strongest players off them at this stage in the season just shows the ability and the financial backing that Woking have this season. Um, just one final question then for you. What would you yep. say Woking's biggest weakness is? Potentially. Ooh. Very tough question. I, uh, I think what I've said so far is is the double header with Aldershot. They just have yeah. such a, a, a disastrous record against their local rivals. Um, stats that I don't have to hand right now. But as I said earlier, I think they've only beaten Aldershot twice uh, in the 21st century at home. 
Yeah. Um, so, so that way a real stumbling block, particularly now that all the shot are winning games again, now they've sat their manager. It's, it seems to be the same sort of style to, to the uh, to the campaign for all the shot. They seem to lose a load of games, get rid of their manager, and then they hit form again, just about in time to, to face Woken. Look, Woken, Woken's, you know, the, the story to their season will be the winter months. Let's, let's not yeah. get over it. Um, they've had some long away games the last few weeks. Their next four home ga- the next four games rather, including tonight, are at home. So there's a good chance working to get some points on the board, including uh, in the FA Cup as well, where they made it through to the to the second round. They faced yeah. League One uh, side Oxford. Well, we can have a, a good record in the FA Cup. If you look back over the last few years, the likes of Accrington have turned up. Uh, and beaten Woken, to be fair to say. Uh, but Watford, m- most notably in the third round, what, three yeah. years ago now, I think when Woken came back up, I can't remember which season it was, but Woken only lost 2-0 and, you know, what, held their own. Yeah, really. 18 19, I think it was. was yeah, it 19, 19, 19, might be right, actually, like that, yeah. when, when they came up. Um, but yeah, you know, the real stumbling block for Woking will be in January. And I think for January, for a lot of clubs, you know, you look at Notts County, I think a lot of players or a lot of teams rather will be looking at McCauley Langstaff. So it's how Notts County are going to replace Langstaff, for example. Look, you know, Notts County have got, have got a great wallet, let's put it that way. And they sell their, their best player, that they'll be duly rewarded and I'm sure will reinvest back into the team. Woking have got a good side at the minute, they've got a fit side. Um, because they work very hard in their games. But in terms of injuries, I don't think they have many to report at the minute. Jack Rolls might be the one struggling, but he should be involved tonight because Darren Sell has promised changes and he should get them because Woken have played a lot of games, as have a lot of clubs. But um, yeah, I think the real stumbling block will be their form in January. I, I haven't got the fixtures to hand, but when you start going to places like Notts County, which I know is their third last game of the season, I think off the top of my head, their last game's a trip to Sully Hole. You know, you're looking at that's currently first and fifth in the table away from home in the final couple of weeks. So yes. we'll see. It's a long old season, as I say. Woking are really enjoying themselves. Um, good form at home. They're proving tough to beat wherever they go. And let's face it, Woking have got nothing to lose. They've got high ambitions. They put a lot of money into the team. And let's just see where they go. If I liken it to my Premier League side, Arsenal, we're currently top of the pile. Why can't we win the league? Yeah, Man City should on paper. But for the whole time that Arsenal on top of the league, why can't we believe? <laughs> to heart, I don't think Arsenal will. I think they'll finish second. Uh, to a very good Man City team who have the best striker, the best midfielder and the best manager. We could say that about a lot of clubs in the National League. But for the whole time that Arsenal and Woking are there, just enjoy it. And I'm sure the fans are for yeah. both respective clubs. There must be a few Arsenal Woking fans out there like me. Yeah. But uh, if we speak to speak about Woking, a uh, big game tonight against Dawkins. There should be a lot of goals. I mean, you'll probably watch this back and it'll be a nil-nil, but uh, should be a I lot of goals. Far too. Yeah. <laughs> it's <not> like <laughs> that. But um, looking forward to it. As I say, big few months of Woking. Let's see where they can end up. On to Halifax Town now, and I'm pleased to be joined by Tom Scargill from the Halifax Courier. Tom, it's great to speak to you a bit about Halifax Town start the season. I think a season of ups and downs so far would be a fair assumption, wouldn't it be? Current position, not great, but the form has picked up recently, hasn't it? Could you give a slight overview of that? Yeah, I'd agree with that. Um, typical Halifax Town, really, and it's never straightforward. It's always a bit of a roller coaster. Um, a lot, lots, lots of t- corners turned. It's kind of, it's been like a rectangle, really. We've turned that many corners and ended up back at square one again. But hopefully, uh, this is kind of more of a permanent corner that's been turned. Um, took a very long time to get going this season, longer than anyone will have anticipated. Um, very slow out the blocks, really. Um, you, you thought with um, a little run of form that they had that they, they kind of got going and then it kind of slipped back again. Yeah. Uh, some really kind of uh, dreadful performances and results that have just kind of felt like a complete slap in the face after all the optimism in pre-season. Um, but as you say, hopefully they're, they're finding the feet now and Chris Millington was saying after Saturday, hopefully there's a bit more steeliness about them now and a bit more um a bit more they're a bit more resolute at the back so hopefully yeah. the, you know the the shipping the goals against the likes of Aldershot and working is a, a thing of the past now and they can start to climb up the table a bit more yeah highlighting those two games especially especially the working game being at home it was such a shock I think and I think the, going into that game, it felt a bit toxic, I think, in the air of the Shea yeah. Stadium. A lot of fans were not too confident going into that game, just after the back of the previous games that we'd had. And obviously, to perform like we did in that game, it, it felt like we'd hit rock bottom after that. And then to obviously get a win against the York side, a strong York side, ever since we've defeated York, it feels like we've turned a corner and we're really starting to gain some momentum now, doesn't it? Would Would you agree with that? 
Yeah, I think you have to kind of take it with a pinch of salt after this season because there have been times before where you think they've got a bit of momentum now and they're starting to progress. And then, like you say, the working game was probably the low point in a, in a season of fairly low points up to then. Um, but hopefully, I mean, Millington said in it after a previous defeat, I think it was Notts County, that you know that this has to be the, the rock bottom point of the season now, but it turned out it wasn't. But yeah. The, the transformation from working to York in the space of four, three or four days was quite remarkable. Really, it's uh, incredible how they how they turned it round, performance and result wise. Um, and to be fair, they probably haven't looked back since. Um, different types of games they faced since then, different types of performances. Um, but now the four unbeaten before Wrexham, uh, three of those clean sheets, three of those wins. Um, and I think, ironically, Millington is, is probably a better manager for the start to the season. He'll learn a lot about his players. Yeah. Um, and if it does turn out that they climb the table and they, they kind of do end up making something of the season, then, you know, David Buzzard must came under a lot of pressure earlier in the season to get rid of Millington. Yeah. Uh, you know, let's see how it pans out. But if it pans out well, then I think the chairman will probably deserve you know a fair bit of credit for sticking with Millington when, as I say, it was under a lot of pressure to get rid of him. Yeah, for me, I was probably one of those people that was Millington out. I think it was after yeah. the older shot game. But prior to that, we'd actually, like you've said, got a bit of form. It was you could take it with a pinch of salt. Mm. After that, I generally thought it's time for Millington to go. But he stuck with him. And I have to be honest, he's learning himself, um, mm. Millington. And he seems to have improved recently. But current position, we're currently 17th in the league. Obviously, at the moment, we're underachieving significantly. Mm. At the start of the season, you look at the, the calibre of players on paper that we brought in, Minihan, Keane, De Sarue. You know, on paper, you'd probably think in the past, that should be, you know, looking to go get into those playoff spots, isn't mm. it, based off, the quality and the depth that we had in the squad, but it took a bit of time for us to, you know, get together, get a bit of form going. And I'm not saying that we are the perfect team yet. I, I still think there's more to come from us, to be honest. I think tomorrow night against Wrexham, obviously this will be going out later on, but tomorrow night against Wrexham could be um, very, very pivotal of what we can do this season. Although, yes, it's, it is like, I think, a Man City fixture, you'd probably call it mm. now. Um but then again, I have got a slight bit of confidence that we can potentially go there and get something. But going back to my original point, 17th in the league at the moment, still significantly underachieving. Do you think from now, what would be a realistic aim for this season or potentially an aim that you can actually see just based off how we're playing recently, um, how uh, the game's coming up, etc. What what would what would be an aim for this season from now, do you think? Uh, where would you be expecting us to come? Um. I still, when we're only eight points for the playoffs at the moment, um, Millington said that they've given teams a massive head start. Um, I think, you know, there's going to be the bumps in the road to come. It's not just going to be all plain sailing now. There's going to be defeats, but I'd like to think the difference from now is going to be if they do hit a bad result or a bad performance, that so they're going to be able to turn it around a lot quicker than they have so far. Um, so certainly... You know, if we're being optimistic about it, then I would say minimum top half. Um, playoffs are still obviously very much achievable, uh, but there's got to be a lot more evidence yet uh, from them to show that they're capable of doing that. I think based on the season so far, I think top half would possibly be uh, a realistic ambition. Playoffs, as I say, I've, I've got to see more from them. But like I said, you know, I, I wasn't grumbling about the recruitment over the summer in pre-season. A lot of really good signings on paper hasn't worked out like that. Um, haven't got the performances from some of the players that were uh, anticipated. Uh, what's a, a bit different now as well is there's a bit more of a settled look to the team, yeah. in, certainly in terms of the back four. has been a lot more settled recently. I don't think that's a coincidence that they've got three clean sheets, clean sheets out of four. Deser of has got three in his last three, so he's starting to find the net. Uh, Jamie Cook's got his first goal recently, Capello. So there's little things like that that are yeah. a bit different. But, yeah, if we're looking towards playoffs, then they certainly have to show um, more consistently than they have done. Yep, yeah, certainly. I think, like you've mentioned, it does feel like we're starting to get rid of an identity towards us now. You know, at the start of the season, like put a, some random 11 players out, potentially. It did feel like that. I went to Barnet away and it felt like it just 
picked 11 players out of a hat and then just, you know, picked them and put that as a starting 11 because they didn't have a clue that game. And Torquay, a bit unfortunate to lose that. But, you know, you look at Torquay at the moment, they were very, they're very, very poor. And it did feel like it took a few games and more than a few, in fact. It took 10 or so games for us to really get a settled side. I'm not saying we have a settled side yet. It's still hard to go on there. I don't know if you know what a fan hub is, but it's an app where you predict your predictions. It's still hard to go on there and get 11 out of 11 on your predictions at the moment. But it does feel like we are getting a bit more of a settled side now. It's good to see Disa Rue scoring again. Um, Spencer's on fire at the moment. He, he's a really good player. He could potentially be gone in January if we haven't improved, um, or even if we have improved higher up the table. I still won't be surprised if he does leave the club in January. Deborah looking a lot more comfortable alongside... Um, um, alongside is it Stott? I think he's still with who was he next one? Festus Arthur, that's it. Yeah, Sorry, yeah, Festus yeah. Arthur. They that seems to be getting a bit of a strong partnership together, so it does seem to be going a lot better at the moment. But even the games that we have won, I still feel like has the performances been to the standard of what we have been last season? Maybe against Dagenham, yeah, I thought we played very well, but I looked at this, this side last season and how well we played uh, compared to this season when we have won games at home. I still don't think we're quite at it. And, of course, we, were, we weren't just in the playoffs last season. We were fourth. Probably should have done even better. But another thing that I just quickly like to add as well is probably our away form. Like It still hasn't seemed to have improved. Games like Maidstone away, conceding goals late on to a very, in my opinion, I know it's quite controversial, a very weak Maidstone side. I don't generally think... That's a good enough, in my opinion, if we're wanting to push for top half or even playoffs, if it is still doable at this moment in time. Um, and I think games like Eastley away, you need to be getting stuff there. There's there's a lot of games for me where away from home, we should be doing a lot better than what we are doing. Where at home, it does feel like to be we are sort of improving significantly. And hopefully that away form does come along with it very, very soon. Um, and I think tomorrow night against Wrexham will be pivotal in that and obviously the time that this will be going out we will know more about that work with Tom Yeah I think when you look at uh, the season so far they've just conceded far too many easy goals uh, some of the goals at Aldershot that was a fine example of, of how easy teams are finding it to score against them and it just couldn't go on much longer um, so that, that's been a vital thing that you know Festus Arthur took a little bit of time to find his feet, but he did really well uh, on Saturday um, against Dagenham. Uh, you, yeah, it's, it's tempting to keep harking back to last season, isn't it? But it is relevant because uh, Pete did kind of establish Halifax as a as a, a top seven side, and that's what the expectation was really going into the season. And certainly, first half of last season, you mentioned the word identity. They had a great identity about them as a bit of a swashbuckling entertaining side who, who went for it and attacked and played with pace and energy and that, that's been absent for, for a lot of the season so far it's only recently where they're starting to get that back uh, against York against Dagenham there was a lot more signs of it than there have been and there needs to be more of that uh, players like Golden I think who's done really well coming at right back lots of energy lots of uh, commitment and effort, Spence as well, his socks rolled down his ankles on Saturday, absolutely worked his socks Grealish. off, Jim as well, brings that, yeah, Halifax yeah. Grealish, yeah. yeah, Capello brings that when he comes on, so I think we need to see, need to see more of that. And, yeah. Yeah, the intensity and certainly does need to rise, doesn't it, even more with like Spence and Capello, and they certainly do bring, mm. bring that, in my opinion, um, I, I think that's what our strength needs to be, and it does feel different to last season, we don't, I think, expect to be the exact same side as last season, the way we play, because you can't adjust. For one, we've got a six foot four striker instead of a, a five foot six striker. That's the yeah. difference, isn't it, compared to the previous season? So, of course, we're going to play differently, but it does feel like now Millington's sticking to what his word was at the start of the season. If I remember one of your reports, him saying that he wants us to be a pacey side that plays it down the wings and crosses it into the box for players like mm. Deeson anyway. And that does seem to be paying off, doesn't it, now? Yeah, I think Cook has come in on the right. In the last few games and done really well. Um, yeah. is, um, him, him and Spence uh, have kind of uh, linked up really well. Uh, I think they get on well off the pitch. I think you can see that on the pitch as well, that they, they're able to play at pace and link up well and get the ball at the pitch. Um, I think one of the issues earlier in the season was that Deer Sarovway up front was just isolated. He was yeah. kind of flicking balls onto himself and 
they were playing it up to him to hold it up, but there was no one to kind of link play with. But the, they seem to have addressed that a bit more uh, since they went back to to four three three has, has helped as well because three five two helped in terms of a temporary measure in getting results, but then it kind of ran out of steam a bit. So you know, let's not pretend that everything's rosy. There's a long way to go yet. Yeah, they're far from perfect, um, but if we're being optimistic about it, we need to kind of cling to the the positives as much as we can yeah. and hope that uh, they can build on them, really. So I'm joined by John Crowver from the Altrinham commentary team. Uh, we're going to be talking a lot about Altrinham. Um, so, yeah, start things off, Altrinham. The big season, wasn't it, going into the full-time module? Took a bit of time to adjust to that. But it seems at the moment that you're on track, aren't you? Yeah, I think, I think you're right, Luke. You know, um, it's a season of transition, I think. You know, going from that hybrid model to the full-time model, it, you know, we've lost a few players. You know, we lost Tony Thompson, the goalkeeper, Andy White, Tom Hannigan, who are all playing in Warrington, Warrington Town now. Um, they were key players to the club, um, you know, but we've brought some good quality in as well. So, yeah, it's a season of transition. If you look at where we are, like league table-wise, we've only won three games so far. So, saying we're on track, I think we need a good few more wins really under our belt at the moment. But we're in 16th, so uh, 17th, I think, actually. Yeah. Um, one place behind Oldham. Uh, with it, we've got 15 points. So, some good results recently uh, that are putting us, you know, good result against Dorking and, and a good away win at Gateshead as well. So, um, we're getting there, but still a lot yeah. to work on. You mentioned three wins. And what also interests me is the fact that Altrincham, it took them a fair while to get that first one of the season. So, think about three wins. Yes, it's not exactly an incredible statistic at the start of the season, where now, based off, it's like the past, all three wins have probably come in the past, I don't know, past seven or eight games, haven't they? So, it's actually quite a good statistic there to get three wins. And a lot of good draws as well in there. For example, one being Torquay as well. Obviously, Saturday, very unfortunate. Well, I don't know if you could say unfortunate. I think Torquay deserved to get something out of that game. But quite a bit of a, a blow, I would say, to have conceded so late on to Torquay. But let's put it bluntly, it was a bit of a freak result, wasn't it? It wasn't, I'd say, a result that you often see. I don't think you can say any negatives from it, any particular positives. I just think it was one of those days. Bournemouth away from home, a very, very good point away from home at a strong Bournemouth side. Bromley as well, another, another strong point. So it seems like Altrincham, they were a strong side. And I think at the start of the season, uh, when they were in such a poor position, bottom of the league for a bit of time as well, it always felt like they were in a false position based off statistics. You like to keep a lot of the ball. You like to uh, drive it. You're very direct where you play, which is quite promising to see that you're not just having the ball and not doing anything with it. So it always felt like you were in a bit of a false position. You're always getting a, few, a bit unfortunate with some results. First game of this season being one of an example against Maidstone, for example, uh, when you, I think, you should have had a penalty or something like that late on. There was a penalty yeah. shout late on um, and you're quite unfortunate not to take all three points from that game. So it always felt like you were in a false position where now you are starting to get your awards from certain games. Would that be a fair assumption? Yeah, I think you're right. I think you're right. I think the big thing, I, I would use the word clinical. Yeah. Not been clinical enough um, up front. You know, Marcus Denanga, by the way, He's on fire at the moment. He scored six in six. Yeah. But he'll, even he'll tell you, you know, that he probably should have had 12. You know, um, he's he's missed he missed a penalty against Torquay at the weekend. But he is in a good good vein of form. Um, and we need others in the team to be chipping in a bit more. We've also been conceding quite a few too many at the back as well. And I know that's something that, that manager Phil Parkinson and Neil Saul will be concerned about. But we've, you know, we've lost a few players. Toby Malarkey went off injured as well at the weekend. He's a key player for Altrincham. Yeah. So I'd say it's consistency. If you look across the team, there's a lot of quality in there. Ryan Colclough on the left, who's got league experience, you know, at Scunthorpe, um, MK Don's crew, you know, uh, he's got he's a quality player. Um, we miss a couple of people as well who got injured at the start of the season. Isaac Marriott, who we brought in from... Bradford Park Avenue, yeah. he's, a, he's a big loss in the middle of the park, as is Massey Coslow, who you'll know well from yeah. his time at Halifax. Um, another key player who's, at, who's probably going to be out for the season, unfortunately. Um, he's working well and he's on, on getting back now. But the key word I'd use is consistency. But you're absolutely right to highlight that the recent run of form has been pretty good. You know, some yeah. good wins in there. Phil will be absolutely fuming about Saturday. 2-0 up. Coasting should have been 4-0 up to be fair at half time. 
and then to draw four all where to be fair could have ended up getting nothing out of that game so th- th- those are the things that are frustrating but you know, that's a learning, isn't it? We still picked up a point and that's important. You've always got to pick up. If you can pick up a point on your on your journeys away, you'll do okay, but home form's going to be key and as is the game against Oldham tomorrow night. Yeah, it certainly is. Oldham tomorrow night. Obviously, this will be going out probably Thursday, Friday for the viewers who are watching, but Oldham's a massive game. Oldham are just above Altrinham at the moment. How significant would it be if Altrinham could get a result tomorrow night? I think it'd be massive. Um, I mean, Oldham are a massive club, as we know. We've just talked about the away following. They'll bring over 1,600 tomorrow. Um, they could probably sold out that three or four times. It's only up the road. Um, and they travel in big numbers. You know, still, a, you know, you think of Oldham as a, a big league club. I remember going to watch them against Man United in the FA Cup. You know, that's how big they are as a club. And, you know, they've, they've, they've fallen down the, uh, down the ladder as such. But... They'll come in good numbers. Um, it's a real big test for Altrincham, but if they can get something tomorrow night, and I say you want to mean get something, try and get three points because you're still at home um, in front of your home support, but it'll be a real challenge. But I think if they can win tomorrow, it'll be a real, you know, um, real feather in the cap and, and maybe move up the tra- table. Because um, I think mid-table is, you know, realistically, I think where, where Altrincham should be around, you know, bet- anywhere between 10th and 13th, somewhere like that so that's just mm-hmm. slightly below that at this moment in time you can sort of see what Ultron are trying to do with going into the full-time module you know they've historically and i think it's fair to say being a non-league club always been part-time but always been i think a big non-league club obviously we've seen a lot bigger clubs as such like Notts County, chesterfield and all them come down now and it's a lot different this league to what it used to be but Ultron are always known as a big non-league club weren't they and you can sort of see they don't want to just be that now they want to be you know competing at the top half of the table. That's why they've gone into full-time. That's why they're attracting football league players like Lundstrom, for example, coming down to this level from Crew. He's a quality player as well, I must just add. You know, and you can sort of see that Altrim are wanting to, um, you know, promote as a club, get further up the leagues and hopefully one day get into that football league system because historically there has been opportunities where Altrim could have, but it's due to, I, don't know, I can't even explain it, but it's a complicated sort of... Um, complicated sort of opinion of what happened back back uh, a fair few years ago Elton probably should have got promoted something to do with voting or something like that but yeah just back on the point that we were originally making you can sort of see what Ultram are wanting to do they're wanting to drive up the up the league and hopefully get into that football league one day but you mentioned injuries and that's something that Ultram have always struggled with um even last season and this season especially with Coslo out you know I, I know how good of a player he can be on his day Turbulent Mal- Malarkey uh, coming off injured as well at centre half. He's another strong, strong centre half for Ultron, who's key as well. So you can sort of see that Ultron are getting a bit unfortunate with a few injuries, but also it's about dealing with those. And I think going into the full time module, I don't know if you have any more information, but I do believe it's a slight bigger squad, isn't it, this season than previously? Yeah, I mean, you know, you, you raise a good point about injuries, but every club's going to get injuries. And, and you know, you've just you've hit the nail on the head. How do you deal with that? You know, for me, losing Isaac Marriott, well, if we didn't have yeah, Josh yeah. Lundstrom in the middle of the park, who's, I mean, alongside Elliot Osborne, but Lundstrom from crew, you know, to me, is a real deal. He really is um, a quality player. Um, and it's great to have him in there because, you know, as I say, losing losing Isaac Marriott, who is only 23 years of age, by the way, but he's a quality player. Yeah. And I think he was going to have a big season. He's industrious. He's got energy. He's good in the tackle. Um, he wants to improve. He's already proven that from moving from Bradford Park Avenue. But I think some of the players that that have come in are doing a good job. Um, it's just getting that consistency. Um, there's some good young lads coming through as well, which is great to see. And Phil Parkinson is is keen for these players. If they're not getting game time, even though they're on the cusp of getting in the squad, he will put them out on loan because he wants them to be playing. And I agree with that. I think that's a good. It's a good way. I'd I'd rather have a player getting game time rather than sat on the bench, mm-hmm. um, you know. And and I get his I get his thinking there, and he's done that a lot um, with with quite a few players. Um, Ad Roxburgh is an example of that. Um, very good fullback. He's out on loan at Ashton United at the moment, but he's not far off the off the first team squad um, or the first team team even. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of positives. There's a lot of positives there. Jordan Hume coming back, the captain, you know, um, he's a quality player. He'll hold up. He scored at the weekend. I'd, I'd expect him to have a big game tomorrow. He's up for big games, Jordan. And 
no central defender wants to play against Jordan Hume, believe me. Um, he's stocky, he's strong, he gives it out, he takes it. That's what you want as a centre as a centre yeah. forward. And I yeah. think I he think is. he'll um, he'll give the Oldham the Oldham backline a, a tough time tomorrow. Yeah. Right? He certainly is a he's a great player, Jordan Hume, up top for Ultram. I think he's that sort of player that's never really been prolific at Ultram yet, but it does feel like this season could be his season to really push on in the Ultram side. Finally then. What do you think is a realistic aim from now for Ultram at the end of the season, placement-wise? Well, I, I said pre, I said before. I mean, we're on seventeenth at the moment. For me, if they can get a good run, good you know run of games in, um, personally, I'd say anywhere between tenth and thirteenth, something like that. Yeah. That would be you know that would be great to to get to that level. Um, it's a tough league, you know yourself, Luke. There's a lot of good sides in this league. I mean, you look at Scunthorpe United, who were down near the bottom recently, you look at some of their players and I look at it and I think there's no way they're going to be down there forever. They've got, you know, Apter, who, who's came in from Blackpool. He's as good as I've seen in this league. He's a top quality player. Yeah. Um, so it's still early days. I know we've played, um, what, 14 games we've played so far, but you're still only, what, a quarter of the way through the season. There's a long, long way to go. But I think mid-table for, for Olsengen would be a good result this year. I see it as a period of transition. We lost a few players, brought some in. Um, Phil's quite ambitious, so he'll want top 10. He'll want yeah. top 10 for sure. Um, and he's right to be ambitious. He's a young manager. You know, he's well thought of around the non-league scene and, and higher. Um, but he'll want to go on that journey with Altrincham. And the directors have backed him. They they believe in in, in what him and Neil Sovel are doing. Even when it was tough at the start of the season, as you said, we're at bottom of the league. The board were always behind them. And I think if you've got that support, you're going to do well. We've got good training facilities. We've got good players, consistency, being clinical. Top 10, why not? But I think, for me, I think around 13th, 14th would be a good good season. So I'm joined by Chris Phillips from the South End Echo to talk a bit about the South End start to the season. Chris, we've had you on a few times this season. Sometimes it has been positive. Sometimes it's not. Um, it seems to be a a few issues going off off the field. However, on the field at the moment, seems to be going very well, just outside of those playoff spots. Yeah, it's coming together quite nicely on the pitch, as you stressed, for uh, South and United. We still have our worries off the pitch and we have had them for, for quite a long time. But it's nice to be feeling positive uh, about something to do with South and United. And the progress has continued. There was an upward momentum when Kevin Mayer came to the club towards the second half of last season. He celebrated a year in charge last week. And, and during that time, big strides have been made forward on the pitch. And we've seen that just recently. I think that's seven games on beaten now for, for South End in the National League. And at times this year, they've been on top in games and haven't been able to, to make that count. They haven't turned that pressure into, into the points they should have got after sort of failing to convert enough of the chances coming their way. So that's been especially nice just on, on Saturday and, and on Tuesday night as well that the South then managed to score three goals in both games and, and keep a clean sheet without being rude or disrespectful. The, the teams weren't particularly strong that South End played against. They, they weren't at their best and, and I'm sure they'll be disappointed with their own displays. But South End were able to take advantage of that and that's not something they, they've often done this year, as I touched yeah. on before, with not converting enough of the opportunities coming their way. So that's certainly the positive for South End now. I've got two more away games in, in succession, Barnet. And, uh, and York as well coming up. So it'll be interesting to see how those go. But as you say, yeah, it's starting to, to look positive for, for South End, and, and that's great after the last few years that we've had. Yeah, they're becoming a, a difficult side to beat. You know, I think you, you look at Wrexham and Knotts and Chesterfield, and we've said this even with the recruitment and everything, they're not yet on the same level as, uh, as those clubs at the moment. The second season in the National League, they haven't got that same quality there and the finances that, to their disposal at the moment. However, what they are doing, South Bend, is they're becoming a really compact side, a side that isn't particularly leaking too many goals. They've never, in the games they have lost, been battered after this season. And um, yeah. they're, also, they're also, like I've mentioned, not conceding many goals at all. But they make, they're make a really hard side to break down. I remember when Halifax played them early on in the season, South Bend haven't probably have got the best of form at that point. But although, obviously, you missed that penalty, which you probably should have scored, it was a good save by our keeper. Throughout the game, we were probably the better side, but South End made it really difficult to break down. And that seems to be something that they are doing. And recently, you know, six goals in the past two games, yes, not against on paper the greatest opposition in Scunthorpe and Maidstone, 
But six goals in two games shows that you, you're turning the corner. And also, the fact that you haven't conceded a goal as well also adds to that too. And it's a lot more promising, in my opinion, now at Southend. And I'm sure with these two away games coming up, difficult places to go, but winnable games for Southend and two sides that I think will test you. If you can get some decent uh, results there, by um, in, in the next two weeks or so, Southend could be in those playoff spots, couldn't they? Yeah, definitely. And then we've got Notts County after that, which has just been put on the telly. So so that'll be an entertaining evening as well. But you are right. I think Southend have got the best defensive record in, in the division. So they made themselves very hard to uh, to break down. And, and that's despite losing goalkeeper Steve Arnold, who was player of the year last year. He was fantastic. So they lost his services. I think Halifax, as you touched on, I think that's the last game he played, actually. And that was sort of two or three games in into the season. So Southend have been without him. They were without Nathan Ralph, who's a defender, who's a key player and he's the club captain so they have been missing sort of two vital components of the defense but despite that they've still been able to have an, an excellent defensive record and have that solidarity at the back which does make them very hard to to, to break yeah. down Colin made a good early save last night and Maystone hit the post in the second but other than that they don't give away too many chances South End and, and that's certainly encouraging from from our point of view is that they have got that to their armory especially at the other end where up until recently we have been struggling to, yeah. to score enough goals. Um, so it's, it's been good to have that defensive record and hopefully that can be a, a sign of things to come and, and Southend can continue to, to move in the right direction. Casper yeah. Lapat has come in and he, he's got to be one of the best defenders at, at this level. He's probably too good to be playing the National League, but he's, he's getting those games behind him. Sean Hubson's yeah. come in and done well. Gus Scott Morris. So all across the back line, yeah. everybody is, is playing well and, and you are right. Southend aren't giving too many opportunities away. It's not just that they've been a, a little bit lucky with sides not finishing their chances. Sides aren't getting that many opportunities. So that's been a positive from our point of view. I think there was three goals that we gave away at Chesterfield, which was, which was a bad night, especially when they were down to 10 men. But that's probably the only example of when South End have left themselves a little bit too open at the back. And other than that, it, it's been excellent at the back. And touch wood, that, that can continue because I don't want to put a curse on anything. <laughs> No, you don't, uh, especially at South End. But yeah, I, I actually like that strike, um, that strike, little strike attacking force that South End have. I, I looked at the start of the season, sort of fascinated me with Mooney and Powell being two quite small, nippy strikers slash wingers that can you know score goals, but are also good on those wings. You know, they give, um, they give me, uh, they, they're quite dangerous at Halifax. I thought those two players, they looked quite dangerous down those wings, and I, I, I was quite jealous of those players at that time, but also to have someone like Jay Card coming back from injury, you know, he's proven in the past that he's a prolific goal scorer at this level when he's fully fit. And he seems at the moment that he's getting back to full fitness, you know, two goals, um, uh, two goals at the weekend, obviously against Scunthorpe, I do believe. Um, yeah, it was against yeah. Scunthorpe. So he seems to be good. He seems to be getting back to full um, fitness and he seems to be getting back on form. And that strike, that strike force of Hyde in the middle, Powell and Mooney on the sides, it's really promising for South End, especially with the defence, um, you know, being so strong at the moment. You look at games like, like I mentioned, York away, Barnet away. Those sides will probably be fearing you at home, to be honest. York will probably be going into that game thinking it's a difficult game. We'll probably take a point at home to a side like South End. Yeah, and it's going to be interesting to see what happens now with the striking options. So, you're right, Jake Hyde got a couple of goals at the weekend. I think that made it four and five for him. But mm -hmm. he didn't play last night because of the match was played on an artificial pitch. He, he's not a fan of those. And with his injury record, he tends to miss yeah, matches. Yeah, I saw the article you did. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He, he was quite outspoken about it, which was yeah. quite good for my hits. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. That, that was... Uh, that was quite good. But in his place, Callum Powell and Chris Ray came in. Chris Ray had been on the bench for, for the last 10 games, but he got an opportunity and he was fantastic. He was probably mm -hmm. man of the match in, in my eyes. He had really good sort of first touch, very strong, could turn a man. And he was really posing all kinds of problems for uh, Maidstone last night. So now what does Kevin Mayer do? Obviously, Jake Hyde yeah. had been informed prior to that. Um, does he come straight back into it or does he stick with Chris Ray and Callum Powell, who, who both scored last night? So... That's going to be a, be a bit of a conundrum where Kevin Mayer is concerned. But it's good to have those headaches that strikers are scoring because that hasn't happened so much this season. And Jack Bridge has, has really come to the fore as well. He's he's a winger um, at the moment. He, he's playing at left wing back, but he's he's been sensational. He's probably been the biggest threat in the last few yeah. weeks. I think he's got 
four assists in five games before last night. And if you haven't seen the goal from last night, make sure you look it up because it's a... It's yeah, a I've seen it. We've seen it now. Yeah, yeah, it's a brilliant goal. And he probably doesn't get enough goals with the talent that, that he's got at, at his disposal. So, so he's doing really well. He's a real key player. And it's strange with Mooney. Mooney's dropped out. He, he's had a little bit of a groin injury. He's missed, yeah. missed the Apple Cup game and the two league games since then. But he's a talented player. But... He probably dropped off a little bit, given the high standards that he does set himself. He scored a winning goal earlier on in the season, but I think he went sort of seven or eight games without scoring and without getting an assist. And although he'd have like a, a few really nice touches and a few really good bits of skill, it wasn't really resulting in, in an end product as such. Yeah. So he's now got to get himself back to fitness and try and get himself back into the team because he's undoubtedly a good player. Um, but the thing is now, Southend have got those options and that extra competition for players, which is Reef Murphy's coming back and Harry Taylor's coming back now. So those that are coming in really got to make the most of their opportunities. Otherwise, they're going to find themselves out of the side. So it'll be interesting whether or not that happens to Jake Hyde this weekend and with Dan Mooney when he's back from his injury as well. Because I think as it stands, he, he might find it a little bit hard to get straight back into the side the way the last few performances have gone. It's a good option to have, isn't it? It's a good problem to have, in fact, when you've got players out the side that on paper probably should be getting into the into the side and you've got that option where you're like, oh, I don't know where to play Hyde. Um, should I put Mooney in? Should I put Powell in? You know, you, you've got that problem, haven't you, of where what players to bring in. And that's something that's good to have. Um, obviously, not too much. We've seen sides like Halifax struggle when they've had that strength in depth. It hasn't worked to their disposal because what's happened is they haven't known the best 11. Where at South End, it seems to be perfect because they can bring in players when needed, but they've also got a settled side at the moment. And the players that do come in, when, like Mooney, for example, gets injured, are doing a very, very good job um, at South End at the moment. You mentioned Taylor's coming back. He's a really, really good player as well. Um, he was at Barnet, I do believe, as well. Yeah. I think he did well. He did well at Barnet last season. He's a player I highly rate as well. Probably one of Barnett's star men last season in quite a poor Barnett side. So, yeah, I think, to be honest, I think South End are in a very strong position at the moment. What would a realistic aim be for South End at the end of the season now? Obviously, just outside of those playoff spots, on form table, you'd probably, you would be in those, uh, in those um, playoff spots at the moment. Um, what would, would it be to get in those playoff spots or would it be to potentially, and I know it's a big ask, maybe get fifth, fourth, um, where you get a home tie, or oh, even, I know it's a big ask, um, but second or third, which is probably a little too far. Yeah, I think it's good to have those aspirations and, and it's good to be um, looking up the table for once after the last few seasons, yeah. the last sort of three years, we had sort of back-to-back -back relegations and last year we started so badly that it looked like relegation could be on the cards again. So it's nice to be looking up the table positively rather than, than looking down it and, uh, and, and fearing the worst. And I'm always one of those people that I think you should set your standards and, and your aspirations as high as you possibly can. I don't think you should say, oh, we'll be happy with 10th, because if that becomes in, into your mindset, then I, I think that can sometimes limit what you can go on to achieve. But that's only me talking as a person individually. But I do think with the talent that the South End have got in their squad and the way they're playing at the moment, then yeah, why not? Let's, you know, They could definitely get into the playoffs. There is a yeah. lot that goes on off the field at, at South End, and you always do worry that that could eventually at some point down the line have a little bit of a, of a knock-on effect and it could disrupt some of that momentum or it could um, change one or two things if we've got some injuries and we've got a transfer embargo then you can't bring players in to replace them and and whatnot but if you concentrate on on the matters on the pitch and how well South End are doing then I think you definitely have to be aiming for the playoffs I think that's I don't see any reason why, why South End shouldn't be able to get into those. And you've certainly got to aim for it. Like I said before, I don't think you should just say, oh, yeah, we'll, we'll go for top 10. That'll be all right. I think you've got to have those goals and try and finish as high up the table as you can. And, and South End have got a good defensive record. They've got players scoring goals now. They've got options from the bench. They've got a good manager. So I don't see any reason why not. Um, it's all positive. You, South End of Sex, only Notts County that are above South End in, in the form guide right now. So things are coming together and you don't get carried away because especially supporting South End, you know that uh, things can change very quickly and um, it's quite an unpredictable club that's probably like no other at this level. Still can't believe no one hasn't chosen it for a Netflix documentary <laughs> yeah. or, or anything like that because it'd be probably more dramatic than EastEnders. But um, as it stands, things are coming together quite nicely and uh, just hope that that can carry on because it, it's making a, a nice change after the last few years. 
So we are joined by another commentator on um, this edition of the podcast, um, and it's Solial Moors, which sort of decides what we'll be talking about. We're going to be talking a lot about Solial Moors. Now, they were a side for me at the start of the season, Ben, that I had such high expectations for, and they're sort of proving me correct, especially at the start of the season. But obviously, I actually put them in the top three, and probably even, I'm going to be honest, I put them top of the league. I had a slight feeling, which was quite bold of myself, to predict them there. Uh, but I looked at the quality that they kept from the previous campaign and, of course, the quality that they've added to the side. I generally didn't see why they couldn't go for the title this season. However, based off games they have played against the so-called stronger sides, like Notts County, it does seem to be that you're slightly lower than them. Ben, could you give us a, a slight overview of Solly Old's season, please? Yeah, so I think if you look back, this is going to seem weird for me to say, but I think that if you... Think back to yourself putting Moore's top of the league. I think that that wasn't the worst assessment of all time. And I think the reasons for that are fairly obvious. And I don't think there's anything that I've seen this season that makes me think, yeah, they can't win the league. And what I mean by that is not so much that they're going to go and win the league from where they are now. I don't think that's going to happen. I do think Notts County and Wrexham are too good. But when you look at the performances that they've put in. You've rarely seen the Moors at their best. And to be honest, I think that if we'd have spoken a few days ago, obviously we're talking just prior to um, the for Moors at Maidenhead and obviously yourselves, yeah. Halifax at Wrexham, we've just come off of the Eastley game, a 3-0 win at home, where we looked absolutely sensational, full of control, perfect 90 minutes of defending and just impenetrable and we, we didn't create a whole lot of chances but when we did we were putting them away and that's you know, we, we were fully deserving maybe 3-0 slightly flattered us yeah. um but but I think certainly 2-0 was was more than reasonable and I just think that it was a full professional 90 minute performance and we've simply been lacking in those this season we've a lot of our games have been games where we've scored a load of goals and we've beaten teams quite convincingly and yet we've been left looking at instances where we've maybe given opponents one or two chances too many we've defended well for 88 minutes but those yeah. two minutes we've just fallen apart and and given up really simple opportunities and those have led to you know that our kind of defensive record not looking as good as it perhaps otherwise could do. Yeah, you, you do mention the defensive record of Solio Moors. I always see Solio as a strong side defensively. They've always probably been known, it's probably changed since Neil Ireland's come into the club, which was obviously last season now. Um, they've always been known as a, 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 a not really a football inside, if that sort of makes sense, of possession and stuff. They're more of a side that frustrate the opposition. A bit like what Ball and Wood are now, not particularly a football inside, where under Neil Ardley, they fought the format of the club and how they play on the fields just totally change. And you look at the players to your disposal, I think, for example, Sabara, um, Dallas as well, they are probably two of the best strikers in the league and most consistent strikers in the league. Probably, apart from maybe Mullin and Palmer, was probably the strongest uh, strike partnership last season, potentially. And you also look at the additions that they've made in, for example, Kelly coming in from Maine, and he's a player at the start of the season. I said, it'd be so good if we could get him from Maine as a Halifax fan. And obviously, Solil doing the business to bring a player like that in, I just couldn't see why how it did it, how it could go wrong. And another thing that I'd just like to quickly add as well, you haven't brought in a shipload of players. You brought in three or four players that have all got quality and good pedigree of players. Where other clubs potentially, Halifax being ourselves, have brought in thirteen players that are well known at this level, but it's more quantity than quality. And that's something where Solil have gone well this season. They've kept that squad together from last season, which was very successful. And probably very unfortunate not to get promoted. And then also added to that with strength in depth with the likes of Kelly coming in as well. Would you agree with that? It's so interesting, isn't it? I almost feel like Halifax are an NFL team that has won the Super Bowl. And a lot of their players have become free agents. And yeah. what happens with those sorts of 
those sorts of players is they get these big offers from other clubs that they can't turn down. And in the end, they all get poached and they end up being a completely Joe average team the next season and having to completely rebuild despite being defending champions. Obviously, you know, you, you weren't champions, but, uh, mm-hmm. you know, you really did punch above your weight. And as a result, people have seen that scouted you out nabbed all your best assets for the most part and so you've had to rebuild from that and that's inevitably uh, a, a hard thing to come back from and so I think that's why like you say a lot of teams and a lot of supporters want to be in the Moors position which is where as you say they've made those refinements and I think that the refinements that you've talked about you look at the likes of Josh Kelly uh, you They've, they've been superb and, and you can't argue against them. Uh, I think the main real point of concern for the Moors has really been at the back. And that's not to say that there's been any disappointments individually. I think there's probably been some um, critiques levelled at Thigra Kelleher, for example. Yeah. I think he's maybe been seen by one or two as a bit of a, a weak point in the side. Um, I myself have argued that certainly in some games it was notable that probably the Moore's best defensive performance so far the season came when he was in the lineup alongside Alex Goodger and not with Callum Howe in the team yeah but uh I think that the, the, the identity of the Moors really has been changing it, it's it's been stages with Neil Hardley. Neil yeah. Hardley came into this this job with a great reputation of defensive manager, which, by the way, he loves to joke with me about every time I try and bring up the fact that the Moors have outscored the opponents by some stupid amount of goals to a yeah. slightly less stupid amount of goals, like 5-3 against DC last season being one particular example. And at the start of last season, we were just like... He wasn't nuts. We were scrapping out games 1-0, being yeah, very exactly. defensively strong. And then we had a small spell towards the back end of last season where we were conceding goals for fun, but scoring goals were even yeah, more fun. Exactly. And then this season, it's been a case of we're doing things mostly right on in both boxes, but it's really been defensively where... Every time a team comes in and plays the Moors this season, it's only the Easter game that's really been different from this. Mm-hmm. A team is always going to have one chance or two chances. And whether those be through defensive lapses or goalkeeping errors, and with obviously Louis Molden being relatively inexperienced, good shot stopper, but his command of the box has been questionable at times. Mm-hmm. Then you, you, know, you look at players losing headers on set pieces, things like that. It's generally been those sorts of things where the Moors have been called out at times. I think in terms of the forward play, one of the perhaps slight niggles that I think might have come into the side at times, and I'm thinking mainly of the Yeovil game here, is that we've tried to play a bit too much. Neil has even cited himself in interviews that we just don't really have a proper target man uh, without Kyle Hudlin. I think Alex Reed is the closest thing we have to that, and he is respectable in that regard. But we don't have a giant who can go and win you those long balls, and that is your kind of routine, basic National League football. And so we've had to try and find other ways to win. And I think that, particularly in that Yeovil game, we were a bit too guilty of just trying to walk it in, pass it around. And ultimately, we never really tested the goalkeeper in that game. It's it, it's only that one game where it was a real serious problem. There's been a couple of other games where it's reared its ugly head at times, but we've done enough to win games. Uh, but yeah, in terms of the style that the Moors play, I think you do have to say it is evolving more into an attacking, pass-oriented team. Still got that toughness in them, but they're not always going to sustain it over 90 minutes. You also um, have that ability to adapt as well. We saw last night, like you previously just mentioned, um, start the season, they were just very tight defensively, winning, scrapping games out 1-0. So I think a lot of sides got frustrated against Halifax being one of those teams where they defeated us 1-0. And over the course of the nine minutes, it did feel like it was more even than it probably was let out to be. Um, where the back end of the season, you became this prolific goal-scoring machine. Um, another player I haven't actually mentioned, obviously, Reed, who came in from Stockport. He's added so much quality to the side as well. 
you know, it just does feel like defensively that you can be a little vulnerable at times. But for me, I don't think that's too much of a concern. I think it's because the way that you're playing at the moment with your attacking football, it will also open uh, you up slightly at the at the back. And I don't think it's been too much of a problem so far. And I'm sure Neil Hardley will be able to address that if it does become an issue. One final question then for you, Ben. Um, what would a realistic aim be for the end of the season from now? Obviously, we're still early in the season, a third into the season now. What do you think a realistic aim would be for Solihull this season? Would it be just to get in the playoffs, cement of players, top three potentially? Or even, I know it's quite a big ask, but the title? I think the title is too big an ask. I think what we've seen with the National League is that the likes of Knotts, the likes of Wrexham, I would have put Chesterfield in this category until a few weeks ago. I might have even put ourselves in this category to begin the season. I think there's every chance that we can get back to this level. You you win every week. You win on your bad days. Like you said, That what the Moors do so well is they find ways to win. And Wrexham did that so well last season as well. You just got that winning mentality. And... The National League, I think, has be evolved beyond a point where the team that wins the league is the team that does the basics the best. I think sides like Stockport last season and the teams that I've mentioned already, they're just fantastic football sides in all departments. And I think that when you give a, teams of that calibre a head start, you're going to be very hard-pressed to catch them. And that's the scenario we're in. But I think the most realistic aim has to be, if we can't beat them two, you've got to be in that top three. You've got to get yourself that home semi-final, the buy through the first round, and then get through the playoffs. And everything that you do has, has got to be geared towards knowing how to get through that big occasion and I think the Moors haven't had a taste of it Neil Ardley of course haven't had two tastes of it because he was there with Notts County previously losing the final to Harrogate I think it's a lesson learned what happened in, in that in that playoff campaign and you've got to take that to evolve into the team that can get over that final hurdle I think that's as simple as I can put it third yeah. get through the playoffs get that home semi-final and then go and win those last two games. So I'm joined by Tim from Fearless in Devotion to talk a bit about Wrexham. Well, I don't know where to start, to be honest, with Wrexham, the season so far, the documentary, etc. There's a lot to talk about, in fact, with um, Re- over in Wrexham in North Wales, in fact. Um, yeah, just give us a slight overview of Wrexham's start to the season so far. Unbeaten at home, no, not even dropped points at home this season so far. Yeah, I mean... If, if we could play all the matches at home, that'd be great. We, we'd win the league by maybe February. Um, but, yeah, home, we're, we're ridiculously good. And, well, for the most part, in a way, we're sketchy. So it's very, very different. It's You know, we just haven't really, we haven't really fired on all cylinders away from home. And none of us can really put our fingers on it. You would think there would be more pressure to perform in front of 10,000 people every every home game, but they seem to be thriving on that a bit more than maybe the away games. So I, I don't know what it is, but yeah, it's a strange one. I'm just hoping that, that it'll, um, it'll pan out a bit more productive on our travels than what it has been because, you know, we haven't we haven't beaten Chesterfield. We lost to them. We lost, lost to Knox County and we drew a Boreham Wood, you know. So, you know, we haven't really... Um, come up trumps against one of the other big hitters, if you like, in this division. So, but it's nice to get those games out of the way, yeah. you know, in a, in a weird way that they're out of the way now. We were kind of unlucky against Notts County to a point. You know, we 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 would have been we would have been happy with the draw the way we played for the most part of that game. But we, we did we did give a a decent show in second half. But Chesterfield, no complaints about that, and. Um, yeah, boring wood. I didn't go on Saturday, um, but yeah, apparently the uh, how many times do we say this that the, the officials went went the greatest, shall we say, <laughs> by all accounts? But you've you, you've got to you know you're not playing the referee and, and the linesman. Uh, you know, you've got to play your opposition. And yeah. you know, it's it's uh, if we if we get a win against your lads tomorrow, then it'll be it'll be seen as a point well earned on the road. So we'll see. But long long story short, great at home. 
in different a way. But you know, the, I suppose as the saying goes, win all your home games and, and don't lose away. And yeah, you'll be there or thereabouts. Yeah, you certainly are. I think the only concerning thing is it's against your knots and your Chesterfields away from home. I see it as games where, like you've mentioned, you draw your games away from home against sides of the, of the quality of Chesterfield and Notts and then defeat them at home or at least get a draw at home where it seems like, you know, going somewhere like Notts, going somewhere like Chesterfield, you sort of crumbled in those sort of games where realistically they're games that you should be getting points from if you're wanting to go on to win the league. And if you don't go on to win the league and let's say Notts or Chesterfield, or even like a ball and wood or Solly will win the league, which is obviously unlikely. How would Wrexham perform in the playoffs? Because I remember you saying the playoffs isn't for Wrexham. You have to win the league. And games like Chesterfield and Notts County away from home, if you're wanting to win the league, you've got to be getting points um, away from home and potentially even wins there. It's a weird one, isn't it? I mean, we all know it's a weird division. And like, yeah, Notts County fans can be rightly... Delighted that they beat us, and and they're, they're probably rightly rightly happy at the moment that we we only managed to draw the other day. But then you look at the other side of that, and they they lost at Dorking. We absolutely hammered Dorking. So it's weird. It's a weird division. And you know if 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 we can hammer Dorking and Notts County can lose to them, you can't tell me in October that Notts County are going to run away with it because they're just not. You know we're we're not going to. We're not going to go away anytime soon. You can ask Stockport that. You know, Stockport fans will know very well that we we weren't one for giving up the ghost. Um, and and we want to make sure that you know when it comes to the sort of busy Christmas period that we're still in a in a solid position. And mm-hmm. to come from behind against uh, Boreham Wood, who are obviously well drilled side, they they play a lot of the dark arts of the game. It wasn't wasn't the worst case scenario, and, and it's easy to focus on. On the idea that oh yeah, Rexham haven't haven't picked off a big hitter, blah blah blah. But you know nobody's that's on the travels. Nobody's come to Rexham yet and picked off us. So it's again, you know, it's it swings around about. So it's very much based on perception, and we we're still we've suffered already with several injuries, key injuries, and we've sort of overcome them to a point. But they'll be back soon. And that'll be that'll be a massive massive bonus for. Parkinson in terms of his team selection and so on. So I'm not I'm not unduly worried. You know we're 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 not we're not you know three well three points behind, and we've got four home games in a row now, including one cup game, the three league games. And you know if we carry on with the, with the home form we've, we've been showing, you would like to think we're going to get a, a very healthy return of points, and then it's down to the to the likes of knots and all that. I think they've got Wheelstone of to to see what, what they're made of now. So th- there's lots of twists and turns, as we know. Um, well, let's see what happens by, you know, May time next year. Yeah, certainly. A lot a lot will probably would have changed by then, but you mentioned three home games up and coming. I'm going to be honest, as a Halifax fan, they're all three winnable games. Obviously, I have a slight feeling, but it's probably because I'm a Halifax fan, uh, that we could get something tomorrow. Obviously, this will be going out later on in the week, but... Um, yeah, the three winnable games that you should be winning quite comfortably, to be honest. Maybe a banana skin in there with a few of those games, potentially. Um, but yeah, you mentioned the winter months as well. Uh, and that's a, that's a period when sides with uh, lack of depth seem to struggle because of significant injuries. If you look, if you notice, I was speaking to a Notts fan earlier today and he was mentioning the lack of depth that Notts County have. Um, obviously, this season, because they've gone for quality more than quantity, I think the term that you'd probably use, well, you look at Rex and they've got so much depth, so much forward outlets. It does feel like in those winter months when injuries start to kick in for a lot of sides, that's when Rex and really will really will become a force more than they are at this moment in time. Would you agree with that? Hopefully, because you know it's it's been well documented that that's where we fell short last season. We didn't yeah. quite have the quality from the bench. You know what Stockport did. And that's where we kind of come up stuck. You know, we had a couple of big injuries towards the end of the season and we didn't have the quality up th- off the bench to replace them. You know, that yeah. That's that's just the, the, the hard hard truth of the matter. So we're, we're better placed this time around for the most part. You know, we're, we're, I'm, I'm hoping we've had our injury woes and worries done and dusted early and that'll be it. And then, you know, we can get, gather that momentum and have a, a clean bill of health and everything else. But... Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I haven't taken a vast amount of notice of other squads, squads of other clubs, and what the depth is like. But 
be quite interesting to see whether the lads just you know reverse psychology or calling our bluff or whether he genuinely thinks it's a thing but i mean i hope so you know and i, I hope uh I hope one of the big fish from up above come and nick land staff because that'd be great as well i don't see it happening that they don't have to sell but it'd have to be a silly offer um so you never know you never know i, I would like to think that we've got the depth now for sure and i would be amazed if um if parky doesn't strengthen you know, in January, because we're now we're now in the same boat as every other club and division. Whereas previously, we, we didn't have that luxury afforded to us. You know, we had to yeah. sort of scrape around, and now we can go right. You know, it's a, it's now a a level playing field in, in that sense of things, and we can we can go out and and recruit where needed. Yeah, we saw last season um, the January editions and what they did to Wrexham for the second part of the season with Ollie Palmer coming in, and what you know the impact that he had on them. You know, I don't, I'm sure you've seen the documentary and you've seen the Palmer Mullin episode and stuff like that. And it just shows, you know, having a partnership like that in a club, how significant that can be going forward and how prolific it is going forward. Because you've seen at home games so far this season, Barnet, it was a bit of a freak result, to be honest. Uh, Barnet liked to score goals, so did Wrexham. But you sort of showed that you can outscore teams. Because I always look at Wrexham, and although on paper you look at defensively, Wrexham should be probably the strongest defence in the league based off on paper with the calibre of centre-halves that you've got. However, you do seem to leak a fair few a goal, a fair few goals in certain games, but you always have that ability to outscore teams. Is there some sort of weakness in Wrexham so far this season that teams could potentially exploit? Yeah, because it's, like, it's only going to there's only it's, it's only going to take one game or one period of a game where you don't find your shooting boots, then all of a sudden outscoring that opposition is redundant. You know, it, it might end up four each, or the opposition might win five four. It's it's gen. It's such a weird thing that uh, unless unless we keep making a, a habit of scoring five six seven eight eight goals at home, um, I just don't see how um how, how it's how it's possible not to come unstuck because ultimately somebody's going to come along at some point and go, yeah, they can score loads of goals, but ultimately they're not very good at keeping, keeping clean sheets and we're not, you know, the, the, yeah. there's a, there's a, a bit of a, a bit of a thing about, I mean, Rob Lainton, our main goalkeeper is now on the cusp of, of a, of a full comeback. He's playing in the reserves on Tuesday, which is a massive boost because on his day, he's arguably the best keeper in the division. And he's been a huge loss. Mark Howard's done an all right job coming in. Um, there's a question mark over some of his shot stopping personally, um, but he's experienced and, and that's what we need. So, but you know, the, the defense has to take a, a degree of accountability, accountability as well. So, yeah, yeah it's, it's it's a weird one, but there's definitely there's definitely an element of softness to us at the moment. There's just a little bit of a soft underbelly creeping in, which I don't like. Because it's all very well scoring six, seven, eight, or, or whatever, but you know that that goal difference is going to count for almost nothing if we're going to be you know, conceding three, four, five goals at, at every game. So it's a weird one. It's it's highly entertaining. Don't get me wrong, because you know, I'll I'll take a horrible two 0 win against Halifax. You know I'll take it all day long. And I'm sure Disa so Uwe is back maybe to haunt you potentially tomorrow of the playoffs. Maybe, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, I forgot about him. He, he's with you, isn't he? Yeah, like, yeah. Let's hope he has an awful game then. I forgot yeah. about him, but yeah, I, I don't know. It, it, it's a, it's a weird, weird thing. It's a, there's no, there's no um, surprise that we're scoring a lot of goals, but it's just the worry that at some point, you know, we're going to miss one or two chances, and then all of a sudden, the opposition's go well. You know, we're we're capable of scoring goals as of the teams that have come here, but the, the danger with teams that come to to give Wrexham a game and not shut up shop is that you might score goals, but you'll concede plenty as well. So that's that's the thing, and that's where we're at. We're just home form. It just looks it's it's as it's as, as good a home form as I've ever witnessed in yeah. supporting them. It's like it's man, just... it is like um, at home. It is like uh, and I don't think you, can, you have this in any other league in English football. As at home, it is like a Manchester City. At home, it is. Um, for Wrexham, so if they can take that potentially into the away form, which is a strong possibility, they can. We do have that potential to be as strong as home. And I know his, historically, you're not as good a, as away usually as you are at home, the top sides. But it is doable for Wrexham to become as strong away from home as they are as home. And if they do do that, 
they'd comfortably win the National League. And I know that's something that never happened in this division. No side ever really comfortably wins the National League. But that's how much having a, a slight stronger away form for Wexman, you know, getting rid of these slight uh, weaknesses in the side that teams can exploit, they'll be a lot higher up the table. Now, just a final question for you. And I, I think I do know your answer, but just for viewers who are watching, um, what would be a suitable aim for this scene? Do you think it has to be um, the title or do you think second or third would probably be okay going into those playoffs? No, it, it, it has to be. It has to be. I mean, you know, if you'd, have, if you'd have asked me the fourth or fifth season in this division, we'd be saying it has to be. But now, with the resources and the expectation and the squad he's assembled, it has to be, you know, and, and, and the, the players and the management have to be able to deal with that level of expectation because the fans certainly are. And this sounds kind of ridiculous as a Wrexham fan, is there extra expectation on you as a fan? And there is, it's weird because there's a lot of, there's a lot of people that don't like Wrexham anymore, which you kind of have to embrace. I didn't want to be that team, you know, that mill wall of like the fifth division that nobody likes and people want to see you fall flat in your face. But if you, if you understand the wider story as to, you know, where Wrexham have been and almost folded and people have tried to take the ground off them and so on. There is that it comes back to the whole thing of Ryan Reynolds saying it is an underdog story in the wider context of it. So yeah, first toss bar has to be the aim. If is it an unmitigated disaster if you finish second or third? No. But our playoff record is dreadful, as we all as we all know. And uh, that's yeah, yeah, again, it's a lottery, isn't it? So you can finish second and come and stuck against a team that finished seventh, which I think Grimsby did, didn't they? They yeah. finished seventh last yeah. season. So, yeah. so there you go. It, it makes it for a fascinating competition. But um, yeah, you don't you, know, you don't get literally you don't get anything for finishing second in, in this division really, unless you're really going to push it through a playoff. So um, yeah, so for for that reason, it's got to be all out top spot or nothing. And I think I think we'll be I think we'll be in it. I think we'll be in it. To, to the to the very very end, but yeah. it would be nice just to be that team that that did like you know I can't remember was it you know Forest Green or whatever where they just carved out a nice lead, yeah. but still treated it like they were only two points ahead rather than fifteen. You know just just be relentless and you have to be relentless to get out of this division. And at the moment we're relentless at home, but we're not away, and that yeah. will come back to haunt us at some point unless we address it. So I'm joined by Tom Atkins from Spire Rights Right, um, a Chesterfield fan, a Chesterfield podcast, in fact. Um, Tom, firstly, then give us an overview of Chesterfield's start to the season. Started well, dipped off a little bit, a little bit, haven't you? Yeah, I, th I think that's a fair comment. Um, obviously, before a ball was cooked this season, we were sort of hoping we could be title contenders. Um, obviously, everyone had probably tipped Wrexham and Notts County to be up there, but I think a few people were also tipping us as maybe like a, an outsider third option to be a title challenger. Mm -hmm. I think um, now we've played 15 games. For me, it's clear to see that we probably won't win the league. I think we'll be more likely to be a playoff team. And I just think the reason for that is that we've got good players. Don't get me wrong. We've got some fantastic players in the team. I just think we're a bit too inconsistent in two areas of the pitch. One of them, we don't really finish our dinner when we create chances. And in defence, we're a little bit leaky. I mean, I think we've got the highest goals conceded in, in the top seven. So that says it all really, doesn't it? Yeah, it certainly does. Uh, and that's something that's crucial, having a strong defence um, in this league, isn't it? And also being able to score a lot of goals. But yeah, I went into the season and I predicted Chesterfield quite low down for them. I predicted them fourth. I think a lot of people were quite surprised by that. And they, they seem to be proving me wrong at first, despite that draw away at Dorking. But you know, I think the occasion sort of got to both sides, in fact, in that game. But despite that, you had such a strong start to the season. You know, you'd beaten a side like Wrexham at home. And I think after that Wrexham win, Chesterfield fans were probably thinking, you know, we are the team to beat here. We we can really go on and win this league. Going to Notts as well, getting a point there. Some may say you're unfortunate to not take all three points there. You know, you looked a really strong side and you've beaten a lot of strong sides. You've played a lot of tough sides as well and managed to, be undefeated against them but what's really been disappointing is the sides that you've been defeated by is a Maidenhead who yes I think both clubs Halifax and Chesterfield both have a poor record against Maidenhead but losing at home to them Dagenham um, a side that I personally thought when they came to the Shea were quite a, a poor mediocre side so that was obviously disappointing from your perspective and then Eastley away from home as well 
obviously then going on to beat Bromley at home. But, you know, dropping points away at a side like York, another playoff contender, of course. But still, if you're really wanting to go for the title, that's a game where you have to be taking all three points in your current position. And what is concerning is there's a bit of a gap starting to be created, isn't there, between Notts and Wrexham compared to Chesterfield. You know, we're, we're only 15 games into the season. You're already five points behind them in four. Yeah, I think um, that York game is probably a perfect way of summing up our season so far, to be honest with you. Uh, I thought the first half, we played really well. Uh, we were all over York, to be honest, and we created a hat full of chances. So obviously, Jeff King scored, scored from a free kick, really nice goal, killed into the bottom corner. Um, yeah. And we probably could have been 2 or 3 nil up and, you know, game over by our time. But then we don't take our chances. Second half, we have even more chances to finish the game off, don't take them. And then York could get back into it a little bit and it gives them that little bit of confidence. Yeah. And then uh, yet another counter-attack goal to concede. And that's the thing with this team. We push so high up the pitch that if you, if you try and play counter-attack against us, you'll, you'll get goals. Um, and I just think that sums us up perfectly. We don't finish our dinner and then we leave ourselves open on the break. And for me, that's not the way to win the league. Yeah, it certainly can't be, can it? Being open defensively on the break, uh, you know, a lot of sides, um, your so-called weaker sides in the division that are, are, you know, strong on the counter, like a side like Dagenham, I'm not saying they're a weak side at all, but they're very strong on the counter-attack. Uh, they've yeah. always been known to be. They are going to, you know, take the chances against you if you can't take chances. And look at the strength and depth at Chesterfield. There was always that concern in the previous season, wasn't there? Uh, when Tishamanga got injured, when all the things happened off the field, it sort of went up and I think a lot of people at one point were saying Chesterfield were going to go on to win the title last season. They sort of I think blew it because of things that happened off the field, the amount of injuries that you had, Tishamanga being one of those. Where this season, you've, had, you've got so much strength and depth. You've had Paul Cook, who's I think a legend at Chesterfield and you know, has had a full season, uh, well, a full summer, in fact, to be able to bring in his own players, which he has. You've seen the players that he's brought in and also have players like Tishamanga coming back from injury and uh, Jeff King as well being a strong name within that and it just seems like now it's I don't really know what to put my finger on it because you can't really blame it on injuries you can't blame it off strength and depth you've got the players for example Banks you've, you're quite fortunate to still have Tisha Manga in the club as well after you know what were happening with him apparently going to Birmingham and that went pear-shaped so you're quite fortunate to still have these players and it just doesn't seem to be clicking does it uh, in recent weeks for Chesterfield yeah, I just think it's all about the consistency, to be honest. I think, um, you know, you can look back to the Wrexham game where we won 2-0 and I thought defensively we were fantastic. Well, that's a Tyro Williams. He put in the game of his life and was winning literally everything. But uh, the problem is, especially at the back, we aren't consistent. We have, yeah. Our, our centre-hours have a tendency to, in some games, switch off and just really look off the pace and uh, give teams chances to score goals. And if you give teams five or six chances, they're going to take one eventually. So, uh, yeah, I think uh, there are areas of the pitch that we've strengthened. As you've quite rightly said, the likes of Ollie Banks in midfield. Uh, our midfield's definitely in a much better state than it was last season. And uh, more recently, we've switched actually to a 4-3-3 and we've stuck Mike Jones at sort of a holding midfield role in front of the defence, yeah. obviously to try and shore it up a little bit. Um, and it has worked to a certain extent. But, um, yeah, for me, it's that back line that really needs strengthening and probably probably up front we could do with another option or two as well. Because even though yeah. Shimanga has, I think he's scored four or five goals and he's barely really started many games. So he's doing pretty well, in my opinion. I just mm -hmm. think that some of the chances we miss are criminal. <laughs> yeah, certainly. I think, yeah, that will be another strength for Chesterfield when he does get back. Because I, I don't know if he's fully fit yet and I'm I, I'm guessing he's struggled in to get in the team at times with fitness levels, etc. Still, I know, I know it's been quite a long time now, but... It's a very bad injury, and I think you're quite fortunate to actually have him back at this moment in time, mm. even if it is just for half or 30 minutes or so. So when he does get back fully fit, that'll be such a strength um, for Chesterfield to potentially have you know, a prolific goal score. And you also have the funds potentially in January as well, don't you? If it's not going to plan, you can potentially bring in players in the, in the transfer window to add to this. But you look at Barnwood at home, that's going to be a tough game coming up on Saturday. Um, FA, well, Gates at home then and then the FA Cup. Um, Wheelstone away then. Bournemouth, though, the first one at home. That's going to be an extremely tough game, isn't it, um, at home? You know, we know what Bournemouth like to do. They like to frustrate the opposition. So, what are your plans for that? Um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 they're one of the few teams in this league that I like to call have your cake and eat it teams because the teams that I actually think when they get the ball, mm -hmm. they play well, they play well, they play good football. But yeah. the minute they lose it, they become the most cynical, horrible, anti-football side you've ever seen. Trying to con the referee, trying to 
crowd your players, heavy challenges, that sort of thing. Uh, I think Bournemouth would have very much one of them teams. And don't get me wrong, I think they're a well-drilled team under Luke, Luke Garrard. Um, they're always up the top end of the table for a reason, because um, they're a good team. So, yeah, it's going to be a tough game at home after Tuesday night, where we probably should have got three points. I think a lot of our fans will be expected to win. Whether we can get it or not is another question, because um, I don't know if you'll have heard, but Ollie Banks went off injured with what looked potentially like a hamstring injury against York, which obviously is a massive blow for us, Big, really big player for us. Uh, I guess the um, the good thing that we do have now is that Armando Dobber has come back, um, and while he was rested a little bit against York, came off the bench. Um, he's, he's a different class player in this league. Yeah. I think he should probably be playing League One, if I'm honest with you. He's a really good player. Definitely. So we've, we've got our own threats. We just need to make sure that we do what we can to counter what we know Boreham are going to do, which is play nice football, but also be very very cynical off the ball. Yeah, Dobb was a special player. You know, I've, I've just seen highlights of him. He, he looks, you know, class above Dobb for Chesterfield. Just finally then, um, I know we've mentioned it, we've mentioned the title and that potentially being out of reach, but what would you say a realistic aim is for, for Chesterfield this season do you still feel because I generally feel you do have the quality in the side to go for the title but then again I think you know you look at those defeats you look at dropping points at places like York and the lack of consistency like you've mentioned maybe the, the title is too far but what would a realistic aim be for Chesterfield this season in your perspective well I think we will see some probably personnel changes in January um, I think one thing that we're struggling with a bit at the minute is that we've got a couple of players who are actually on the transfer list um, that we're trying to get rid of. And Cork mm-hmm. has gone on record to say that we kind of need to get rid of a couple of players before we bring anyone else in. Yeah. So I think what we'll see is in January, we might try and offload those players that currently are transfer listed and sort of out of the, the squad um, and probably try and strengthen the defence. And I think if we do that well, and let's assume Shamanga's going to leave, I, I think someone will come in for him. So let's assume we get a bit of a wedge from that. I think if we can sign a decent striker and probably a good centre half or two and strengthen those key areas, the title's still not out of reach. I just think for now, until January, we probably need to try and keep touch with Knots and Rex and the best as best yeah. we can. So yeah, for me, top three has to be the aim. You know, if, if you want to get the playoffs and go through the playoffs, it's a big advantage to finish second or third, as we all know. So yeah, for me, if we can't win the league, we need to finish top three. Yeah, certainly. I totally agree with you on that. You know, top three is so crucial. I know Grimsby did it last season. I do think, but historically, the National League, most sides do get promoted through the playoffs, so either finish second or third. However, obviously, Hartlepool came fourth the previous season, but still, I think it gives you such a significant ad- advantage to have that home draw as well in the semi final, as well, with yeah. your own fans behind. That concludes this week's edition of the Talking National League podcast. If you did like, please drop us a like and subscribe. Also, if you are new, do the same. We do this on a weekly basis and even more. We have exclusive interviews as well with current players, managers and even board members as such. One being in particular, the Mark White interview we did a couple of weeks ago now. So, yeah, um, thank you for tuning in to tonight's edition of the podcast and we'll see you next week. Bye for now.